Welcome to Living 4D with Paul Check. Today's guest is author and evolutionary ecologist Monica Gagliano. Is nature conscious? That is the topic Paul and Monica talk about in this episode, and it is a question that we should all be investigating at this time. The recent United Nations Climate Change Conference highlighted the many impacts that humans are having on the planet. Big industry and modern practices continue to destroy nature with extreme EMF pollution, extracting fossil fuels, application of a wide array of dangerous farming chemicals, vast amounts of waste in our oceans, and much more. Why, you may wonder, do human beings continue to support big corporations that are ushering in the sixth mass extinction? The answer stems from a centuries-old deep divide in the human psyche that separates matter and spirit, viewing anything spiritual as up there or out there. Here is a little history lesson to help us understand this. Prior to the scientific revolution of the 17th century, the guiding principle of the natural scientists was to use science to find ways to live in harmony with nature. In the late 16th and early 17th centuries, Francis Bacon, who is considered to be one of the founding fathers of modern science, changed the definition of science. For Bacon, man is superior to and alienated from nature. Nature is harsh and unforgiving and something that needs to be conquered. Rather than seeing man as part of the web of nature, Bacon sees man as existing as the lord of the natural empire. His domain is nature itself, which he has the power to instrumentally transform and know and use solely for his own purposes and profitability. Since Bacon, the enterprise of science has turned all things and resources in nature into objects. As a general theme, there is nothing sacred in nature in modern science, and that is exactly what has led us into the trouble we are in nowadays. Fortunately, there is a new breed of conscious scientist emerging. And today we are blessed to experience the deep wisdom of Monica Gagliano, one of the world's leading scientists on consciousness in nature, particularly within the plant kingdom. Monica is the author of the excellent book, Thus Spoke the Plant, a remarkable journey of groundbreaking scientific discoveries and personal encounters with plants, which Paul thoroughly enjoyed studying. She is a true pioneer in consciousness studies who has done a tremendous amount to prove Francis Bacon and the modern notion of science to be very misleading. Paul and Monica talk about her background, the challenges she faced within the scientific and research establishment, and how she ultimately prevailed. Monica relates some of her many experiences working with shaman in the jungle and being on specific plant diets and using plant medicines. She tells how the plants made her much more conscious and even helped her design research studies. She shares some of the highlights from her research and how she became the first person in the world to prove that plants communicate through sound. Paul and Monica dialogue about the serious problems caused by the lack of morality in science today, and Monica shares her experiences of being inside the establishment and why trying to change scientists is not likely to be fruitful. She shares her thoughts on the state of nature at this time and the important role all of us need to assume by taking responsibility as caretakers of nature. She describes that we are in a very real initiation process and makes it clear that people will die if they fail to succeed in their initiation process. Monica finishes by describing her plan for a new integrated research center that offers multidisciplinary approach to moral, conscious uses of science, indigenous wisdom, the arts, and her intention to use science to bring forth viable solutions to the challenges we all face today. She invites all of us to get involved in and support this very important project. Monica Gagliano is one of the most notable scientists of our day, and we hope you will gain a lot of inspiration as you listen to her deep wisdom. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Living 4D with Paul Check. Today, I have somebody very, very exciting, very interesting, and very deep and beautiful to share with you. And that is Monica Gagliano. And Monica wrote a book that I came across a couple of years ago, probably close to when it was published. And I read it and listened to the audio. It's called Thus Spoke the Plant. And Monica is probably one of the world's leading researchers on plant consciousness. And so our title today is, Is Nature Conscious? But before we start into the podcast, I want to tell you a little bit about Monica. She's a research associate professor 
in the evolutionary ecology and in evolutionary ecology and director of the biological intelligence lab at the Southern Cross University in Australia. She's an adjunct senior research fellow at the University of Western Australia, a research affiliate at Sydney Environmental or Environment Institute at the University of Sydney. In collaboration with various disciplines across the sciences and humanities, her research aims uh, to aims to expand our perpetual or our perception of animals, plants, and more generally nature. In this process of learning how to do this, Monica has pioneered a brand new research field of plant bioacoustics, which is something we'll get into, and extended the concept of cognition to plants to reigniting the dis- uh, discourse on plant subjectivity, sentience, and ethical standing. Monica has co-published many research papers, and I don't have time to list them all, but they are on her website. And, and Monica, I was blown away with how many papers you've published. And she's the author of an excellent book, as I mentioned, Thus Spoke the Plant, A Remarkable Journey of Groundbreaking Scientific Discoveries and Personal Encounters with Plants, which is available on Amazon in Kindle, paper, paperback, and audiobook forms. The audiobook is beautifully uh, read. I loved it. Um, I did listen to the audiobook and I took a lot of notes and absolutely loved the book. And Monica, she's, as you're about to find out, she's a very lively woman. She's, there's no shortage of spirit running through this woman, I'll tell you. And I found her exploration with the shamanic diets and her explorations of consciousness with ayahuasca and working with science, a beautiful integration of indigenous wisdom and science, and they fit beautifully into her worldview. And so if that's not enough to establish uh, the depth of wisdom of this very special woman, who's also a great artist, I want you to know, um, she's also just an amazing person from a spiritual perspective and is, is dear to my heart. So Monica, sorry for the long drawn out introduction on you, but you deserve a really comprehensive introduction because your work is is mind-blowing. Thank you, Paul, for having me. Thank you so for welcome. having me and for already embarrassing me with all that list of, you know, good things. <laughs> well, you know, I was looking at your website and saw all the publications that you've published, and there must be a hundred um, of them. Maybe not a hundred, but quite a few, you know, like um, I, I am an academic and that's uh, what we do. We we do our research and then we publish it. And if we don't publish it, that it would be a real shame because it's, you know, we need to share what we're doing. It's uh, it's the it's the currency. Yeah. You You are an academic, but I must say. Listening to your book and reading your book, I was so absolutely proud of you because you get your hands dirty and you're not just a left brain, you know, idea swapping, cut and paste expert. You really go out in there and get dirty and get down with the plants and even in your marine biology with the fish and worked with shaman and have done lots of plant dieting, which we'll get into in the interview. But I, what, what really touched my heart, Monica, with you was I'm a guy that's been in this business for 37 years and have done a lot of my own research and study. And one of the things that's sadly missing in science today is morality. And I found you to be a very moral scientist, a very, uh, you really carry the energy of of Mother Earth in you, and and I loved how conscious you are of being respectful to nature and doing research in ways that are as non invasive as possible, and really embracing indigenous cultures and ancient wisdom, and not just strictly, you know, if it doesn't weigh out or measure out, it doesn't exist. And I know from our time. You know, we've been trying to organize this podcast since the beginning of of COVID. So I know that you've met plenty of resistance in the research field. And when you initially tried to publish or do your get your research grant for picking up 
uh, whether plants were communicating by sound, you got a fair bit of pushback. But I'm just so grateful that you've stuck to it because I really feel that you are pioneering a field of conscious science that really is desperately overdue before we destroy the planet. So I just want to say namaste. I love you. I'm grateful for you. And I'm very blessed to have you on the show with us today. Thank you. (laughs) I'd love it, Monica. Yeah, you're welcome. I'd love it if you could share an encapsulation of your background and what inspired you to look so deeply into nature and particularly the consciousness of plants, which, you know, for somebody with an academic background, that's a very, very uh, spiritual, metaphysical, you know, far out concept for someone coming out of a university system. So maybe you can just take us on a a little journey of how that all came about in you. Sure. <laughs> um, I I would say that um, this is not something that uh, came sort of came up. It was something that was already there, and I think is is there for most of us actually, whether you're a scientist or not. And you know, when I was a child, I grew up in Italy, and when I was a child, um, I wasn't really surrounded much by nature. You know, I was, uh, I grew up in an apartment in the middle of a, a small town, a city. And um, the closest that I had to nature was the goldfish in a, in a bowl, you know, or the canary bird in a cage. But even yeah. <laughs> then, I remember, um, especially with the canary, <laughs> uh, I remember that I would let the canary out of the cage. I would close the door. We we lived in this apartment with this long corridor and I would close the door when my mom was out. I would close the door of all to all the rooms so that the corridor was isolated. And then I would get the bird out of the cage and I would tell the bird like, look, you, I know you haven't been practicing flying, but you're a bird and you need to know how to fly because there will be a time when it's for you to fly. And, if you don't practice, you won't know what to do. <laughs> and so there will be this white canary going back and forth into this uh, corridor. And then, you know, before my mom would come back, I would take the bird, put it back in the cage. And, and I said, like, I'm sorry, but, you know, we just need to do this, right? And, and then my mom, a few times, was like, I don't understand. I keep finding poo, bird poo behind the furniture. And I was like, I have no idea how that might be. <laughs> <laughs> and the same was I had a, a hamster and I did the same with the hamster. <laughs> so I think that these, uh, uh, this rebellion against cages <laughs> and limitations and constraints and uh, I guess what is sup- like what we define as conventional wisdom, you know, like everyone agrees that this is how we do things. We put birds in cages, animals in confinements, and humans in structures that blocks their creativity and blocks their expression, and it's okay. And then we are conditioned to accept that that's okay. And so I think that that was never okay with me since I was a child, and I didn't even know uh, that it was such a strong trait that it would manifest later in my career with my work. Um, and yeah, at the end, like even my hamster, at the end, one day, my hamster managed to escape the cage because I left it open on purpose and never to be seen again. And my mom was like, uh, well, I'm sure some cat (laughs) just ate it. And I was like, well, I rather, if I was him, I rather have that one moment of freedom and die free than not dying in a cage because I'm going to die regardless. So yeah. So I guess that's where it comes from. So I think we, and I, I believe that we are all, as children, if you watch kids playing, and, and you know, anybody that's got young children would know, like, this is our human nature when we're not yet completely conditioned to a particular paradigm. And, uh, and this Western paradigm is uh, incredibly uh, strong uh, you know, confining and boxing people into it. So, um, yeah. And then, of course, you fast forward a few years. My, I was, I used to spend a lot of time with my grandma and she was a nurse in a hospital, but also, uh, 
she would, I remember she would tell people when, especially if they were like terminal or if the doctors were like, well, sorry, but we don't know what to do with this. So, you know, you just go home now. And, um, and so some of these people, my grandma, who, you know, she met at the hospital, would tell them like, look, I can fix this. Just come and see me at my house and I'll give you something. And I remember her making this who knows what, because I was too small to really know. But, you know, we would go in the fields, collect some herbs. She would make some stuff. She cooked some stuff. And then she gives these people, you know, something that I guess it was a medicine. And they come back maybe one more time. And usually they come back with like baskets full of salami and parmesan cheese and eggs and herbs and as a thank you. And uh, I didn't realize until she passed and until, you know, I, I started getting insights. Uh, into what actually did happen and what was shaping me without me knowing. But I think basically she was a herbalist. She was a medicine woman, uh, you know, working at the hospital and then working from home to those at the hospital so that the, the system couldn't support. And um, and I know from my mom that she, uh, she was very adamant about, like, um, these work, the plants, this work is not for sale. I cannot charge people for this. Because if I do, I will lose the gift because this is our relationship. And so it's not just about me. It's about my relating with these plants. And, and so then, you know, I can see how that got translated later into my life. And, and I didn't know that that's where it was coming from. My grandma, for what I know, she tried to teach my mom and her sister, so my auntie, and they both said like, no, 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 we, we don't want to have anything to do with that witchy stuff, you know? And yet, um, I guess, as it happens in many <laughs> situations, it jumped a generation and it just like, the moment she passed away, I had the most, and still I do, the closest relationship with her. And so the, the work with the plants initially at the personal level, you know, with the back flowers and the flower essences and all of that came so strongly that it wasn't funny. I never really played with any of this stuff and suddenly... You know, I'm 18, 19, and suddenly I have all of these things happening that, you know, divert my my attention to to that field, and and then of course slowly, slowly it, it trickled into my actual professional life, and then it became like uh, inevitable. It's like uh, all of these bodies of knowing, not knowledge, but knowing, experiencing. Uh, why are they separate? Why are we deciding a priori what is worth? and what is not worth attending to. And so I guess I couldn't help myself. That's how I got to the plants, but also my marine work, in a way, um, helped shape that as well. Because, yeah, I can see now as well that even all of this work up to this point, like everybody's life, everything that has ever happened in my life, it just bringing me to this moment right now where I'm ready to take on the next project and develop the next vision and uh, and it would be impossible without what already has happened so i'm very grateful for all of it yeah it's a beautiful um story to hear and it helps put some context uh with regard to what shaped you into being the person that you are and uh you know i think it's interesting the grandma situation i've run across it many times angie's grandmother was a curandero a shaman uh a healer type and she was considered to be weird by people but there there that was the woman people came to for help my grandmother was the only person that could i had asthma as a child and, and um none of the inhalers or anything like that helped for more than a few minutes but my grandmother would do massage on me and just put her hands on me and I would have days of freedom. And interestingly enough, uh, later in my life when I was in, Oh, I guess my early twenties, long story made short, I became a massage therapist, but somehow I already knew what to do. It was as though my grandmother was living inside of me, you know, and, and, it, and it, it just really is amazing how the love of a grandmother can change your whole life. 
Uh, Monica, I've been practicing what I call modern shamanism for over 25 years and have personally learned a lot from plants and trees and had some very profound experiences working with them, as well as a comprehensive background in the use of plant medicines for healing and conscious spiritual growth. Uh, In fact, in our holistic lifestyle coaching program, it's quite common for me and Angie when we're teaching to teach people how to communicate with plants. And I've taught many of my patients how to communicate with plants for their own healing. A long time ago, I studied the book, The Secret Life of Plants by Peter Tonkins and Christopher Bird, which drew heavily on Cleve Baxter's work. And I tracked him down and found out he lived right in San Diego, in fact, not far from me at all. And uh, he came and did a workshop right in the building that I leased, which was phenomenal. So I actually got to mention, uh, meet him and work with him and ask him lots of questions. And I mentioned this uh, because it's from this background and being raised on a working farm and spending lots of time in nature that immediately drew me uh, to your book when I came across it. So the first note that I took, I actually pulled my notes out of my library uh, to get ready for the podcast. And the first note I wrote down from your book was, keep looking in the wrong places and you will uh, never find, keep looking for the truth in the wrong places and you'll never find it. And I immediately knew, okay, this woman's definitely tapped in. Monica, this statement is deep truth and one that is more relevant to the issues today than it's probably ever been. Could you please elaborate on this from the context of your personal experience, your research, and how you feel that statement is relevant to the issues we're facing today? That's really important, I think. So just to state that again for everybody, Monica said, and I, I took it out of my notes, if basically, if you keep looking for the, for the truth in the wrong places, you'll never find it. So with that lead in, Monica, can you elaborate <laughs> on that, please? <laughs> well, um, it's a beautiful sentence, isn't it? And I would love to take credit, but actually it's not mine. That is from the plants themselves. So, and that's why the book is a vital. Well, if it's, it, yeah, you're living course, it but though. I have no choice. If you, you know, as I know, you've been working with plants, you would know that you have no choice. <laughs> uh, if you're engaging with these yeah. beings, uh, you know, right. they will be very happily teach you. But, um, you know, there is no an expectation because I feel like the choice is always uh, your own. But, you know, they will keep teach you. But the, you got homework to do, <laughs> so you know that was my homework, and uh, and yet uh, in the book, all of those, um, some of them look like also little poems, and they they are the front at the beginning of each chapter, and all of those are sharings from the plants themselves, and they were important to me because of course uh, they were medicine that I was given to work with, and uh, in that context. I guess, uh, if I remember correctly, that is uh, towards yeah the beginning of the book, and and it's kind of the beginning of uh, of the telling of the of the journey. Um, and at, at the start, I you know I was moving from my work in marine science and starting working with plants uh, out of a you know a really an ethical and moral crisis because I was trained as a marine scientist and. And I was doing my science like most of the science that uh, it's done. Uh, and when we work with animals, often we constrain them. Uh, we uh, collect them out of their environment, extract them. And uh, we see them as objects. So, you know, you can do whatever you like. And, uh, and in a way, much of Western science demands the sacrifice of the body uh, so that we can pull apart and, you know, see the different parts and learn about uh, different what different parts are doing. And the idea is that by learning about the different parts, you will know what a fish is or what the fish is doing. And of course, I was trained like that. And uh, and yeah, that's how I operated like everyone else. And so I killed loads in the name of my science and my findings. 
until I had this uh, really intense experience in the field on the reef, on the Great Barrier Reef here in Australia. And and I, uh, yeah, and everything stopped and I had to acknowledge that who I was interacting with was a who, not a what. And um, so there was a person there. It's just that it's a fish person instead of a human person. <laughs> and um, and they clearly, my fish in the field, they clearly uh, pointed out to me that I had no rights to do what I was doing. And my ignorance and my unconsciousness were allowing me to justify violence that was not justifiable. And so uh, out of that moment of like, uh, oh my God, what am I doing? And I cannot do this anymore. And then I did a really big, uh, you know, I used to go every year. I used to do Vipassana, um, a retreat, a silent retreat for 10 days. And, and during, uh, that, that year, during the retreat of Vipassana, I just, uh, yeah, that, that again reiterated that change was not an option. And, um, and I guess as many of us, especially if we're looking at the, at the global situation at the moment, you know, uh, we don't like change. We want things to stay the same, nice and comfortable business as usual. And yet life uh, is always about change. So change is inevitable and we can go consciously or as I did at the time, go down kicking and screaming. <laughs> and so I did. I, I went down kicking and screaming and I uh, I screamed and cried <laughs> a lot. It's like, uh, what is going to be of my life? And, you know, very dramatic. But um, but what happened was that out of that crisis of what it looked like, and it was for me, it was uh, a crisis of identity, a crisis in my work, a crisis in my personal life because everything started disintegrating because someone new was emerging, but I just didn't know. Uh, the plants came, and I often said this I say that the plants rescued the scientist in me because at one point I realized that, oh, maybe I can't do my science anymore. You know, that's it. That's the end of the scientist. I, I, I spent all of these years uh, learning and training and blah, blah, blah. And now I come to a point where my career is just about to start for real. And he said, no, <laughs> we're not going to do any of this. I've had the chance to work with some amazing people and companies over my 37 years of practice. People and companies that are creating life-enriching and ethical products. That work inspired me to partner with many of these companies in our Czech approved shop to bring you some incredible products that I know, love, and trust. And this December is Czech approved month at the Czech Institute. Aho! For the entire month of December, our partners are offering you special discounts on Czech approved products like pendants from Biogeometry, EMF protection from Aries Tech, essential oils from Essential Oil Wizardry, organic food supplements from Paleo Valley, and ceremonial herbs from Celtic Secret. This is a great way to try out and enjoy products that I know will support you in being your fit, healthy best. And if you still have holiday shopping to do, it's a great way to find presents for your loved ones that everyone, including you, can feel good about. So take a few minutes to explore the Check Approved shop at thechekshop.com forward slash check, C-H-E-K, hyphen approved. That's thechekshop.com forward slash check, hyphen approved. I know you're going to find something that supports you in your health goals and will help you look and feel better and live and love more fully every day. Aho. So the plants came about not just in my work, but also in my personal life. This is when the plants really came into my life. And so, uh, you know, both through uh, gardening, but also, the, you know, the, the medicine plants like ayahuasca, uh, really arrived and um and i never really i've never been into drugs in general and i've never really taken any particular you know recreational drugs um, like, uh, it's not a judgment on any of this it's just that it wasn't i'd never felt the affinity to it so i was never really particularly interested and then when the, when i got invited to a ceremony i remember my partner at the time was like monica why 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 and I was like I was so determined I was so clear I was not scared at all I was like this I've been a part of me has been waiting for this and now in this in the midst of chaos I'm ready (laughs) 
And um, so I went to the ceremony and yeah, and of course at that point I remember, I still remember the very first ceremony. I spent the entire night pinned at the wall <laughs> by this uh, spirit and all she was asking was like, are you ready to surrender? And I'm like, no way. <laughs> are you ready to surrender? And I'm like, no. <laughs> and then eventually, uh, you know, we came to have a deal. And I think that for me it was important because, um, um, and, and I understood the value of that over the years as well, watching other people and especially now the, especially the psychedelic plants have become so popular and the psychedelic experience is so in the, in the mainstream really. Uh, I came to realize how important was the experience that I had for, for myself because, uh, what happened for me was that, you know, uh, whether a spirit of a plant or any spirit would ask, you know, surrender to me, that's so nice and good, but I am also a sovereign spirit. So, you know, there is this idea that's like, oh, I'm so bad, I'm making all this mess in the world, but actually I'm also so good. I have the power to make amazing beauty in this world. So, no, I'm not surrendering my sovereignty to anyone, anyone, human or non-human, material, physical or non-physical, Unless I know who I'm dealing with. So I actually made a deal and I said to the medicine, I said, well, I will work for you and you will have my 150% devotion, attention, effort, energy, but <laughs> I need you to show me that, uh, you know, uh, I can trust you basically that the, 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 the relationship is balanced and is in reciprocity, real reciprocity. Once I asked the medicine to, um, let's make a deal. Uh, I'm a sovereign being, you're a sovereign being. If yeah. this is a reciprocal <laughs> relationship, which is based on the respect and there is no anybody higher or lower, we are equal meetings and working together. And so the medicine was like, okay. And she left. And I was absolutely sober for the rest of the night. And then the following day, <laughs> I, uh, I know. And I, you know, of course, at that time, I was like, I see one, when you actually ask the right question, you see, they run away, they run away. They don't want to actually tell you or, or really do the thing. And so my ego was very <laughs> satisfied that I actually managed to corner the medicine. And then what happened, actually, it unfolded over, over weeks because I, for my work, I needed to do a, a diving medical and then I needed to, re it just happened that I needed to renew my driver's license. And, and so at all these medical checks in the, you know, in the Western paradigm, I found myself um, getting the doctor to say, like, well, it says that you need to wear glasses. And I've been short sighted and wearing glasses since I was uh, eight. So this happened and I was already in my late twenties. Eh? Like, so the glasses were part of my face and suddenly I forgot to wear my glasses. And until the doctor said, like, where are your glasses? Because it's written in your record that you should be driving with glasses and doing work with your glasses. And I was like, Oh, well, I actually don't know what the glasses are. And, uh, and, you know, they asked me, so did you have a surgery? And I'm like, uh, uh, not quite, but kind of. Well, I think I, you know, I was doing this meditation. <laughs> <laughs> and that was the deal. <laughs> it took weeks for me yeah, to actually realize that she actually delivered exactly what she was going to and meant to. And so at that point... I, I remember saying to her, like, uh, you show me that you can do something that I couldn't be doing by myself. And I know that it's you. And if you can do that for me, then you have my 150% attention, devotion, effort, and we'll work together. And I'm totally committed. And so I'm totally committed. And of course, you know, of all, this is the beauty as well of these plants, right? Like, of all the things that she could have done for me, she picked on the one thing that even metaphorically has such a powerful message to deliver. She made sure that I could see clearly. No more glasses, no more short-sightedness. You need to see things clearly as they are. And so, yeah, I think 
to me, that was always, uh, it's always a beautiful reminder. Well, there's evidence that you look for the truth in the right place right there. That's right. <laughs> Whether I go kicking and screaming or like uh, with grace, I'm trying to learn to be more graceful in my explorations. <laughs> uh, yeah. You know, one, one of the things that I wanted to talk about, because my, my listeners are pretty savvy people. They're very holistic people. But inevitably, there's going to be a lot of them going, how in the hell do you talk to a plant? So I wanted to share a couple of concepts that I teach my students from my own research and experience, and then have you add or expand or share what you feel. The first thing I tell my students, I say, look, if you look into genetics, you have about 98% of the genes of a mouse. You got something like 16% of the genes of a daffodil, about 19% of the genes of a banana. And, and if you just keep going down the line, you'll see that you have the genes in you to communicate with everything in nature. And I say, as a shaman, my spiritual investigations into the genetics, my soul told me, Paul, what they call junk DNA is actually the history of your biological evolution on this planet. And you actually have a record of every living species in your genome. And you know enough about electronics to know that the DNA is probably one of the most advanced antenna systems in the world. So you can connect to the field of intelligence of all living beings, because what you think of as yourself and your ego is actually a compendium of the intelligence of the entire universe. It's just that you've been educated in a way that has stopped you from knowing the truth of yourself. So that's the first thing I share with them. The second thing I share is, first of all, you got to stop thinking you can't do it because that's immediately going to block you. Second of all, because plants communicate energetically, I tell people, lick your fingers so you have moisture on your fingers and then put one pinch, one plant leaf in each hand so you have a connection and make sure your shoes are off so you're grounded to the earth because you're right on their root system and then just empty yourself and i say now have you ever had the experience of driving down the road or doing something like washing the dishes and you had zero thoughts in your mind and all of a sudden you had a thought come like your mother's going to call you in a minute and your mother calls or all of a sudden, you know what you need to do to resolve the challenges in your relationship, or you realize you need to change your job. I said, so if you just empty yourself of your own thought and be receptive to what the plant or the tree might have to say to you, knowing that if it's not a thought you're thinking, then it must be coming from where your intention is at. And I have taught thousands of people to do this. Some of my students have written entire books on what they've learned from plants and trees. So that's how I teach people to do it. Uh, what, what do you have to share in that regard? Well, what you just share is beautiful. I would say I could add that um, if it's too difficult for someone to imagine the genetic configuration, uh, because it still feels maybe abstract for some, uh, well, uh, just think about your body makes you or it, it remakes itself um, constantly. You know, we are shedding cells. Cells are dying and new cells are, are created and born. And uh, some organs are remade within weeks and days and some others take years, depending. But, you know, so you are actually never you. <laughs> You're constantly being reimagined by your cells. And, um and what material are they are we using to remake the body constantly? Mostly is vegetal vegetal matter. So if anything, we are more plants or vegetal than we believe and think ourselves to be. And so and for for anybody who is vegetarian or if you are vegan, that it's even more extreme because all you eat is vegetal matter. So Pretty much you are made of out of these plants. Your cells and your body is recycling these materials 
and using them to create your building blocks that make the new body every day. So, so how is it possible that you're made of plants? You are a plant in a way. Uh, of course, you can connect that part of you can connect. And I found that the more, the cleaner is my uh, diet, uh, the better I can connect with the world around me just because it feels like maybe because I am more of that world and um, in, a, in a really material bodily way, not in a metaphorical way. And uh, so yeah, that is, is one thing that came to mind as I was listening to you. And then, of course, there is the entire uh, aspect of the energetic. And, and for me, again, uh, which is you, you touched on that as well, I, I just uh, speak to it in terms of silence. It's like our society, especially the Western society, the Western world, is noisy all the time, constantly. Everyone is talking. Everyone is making noise. If it's not a plane, it's a car. If it's not a car, it's a, a people screaming. Siren. <laughs> and if it, you know, that's right. There is always noise. And so uh, it's almost like, how can you hear anything <laughs> if, you, if it's all so noisy? And, and primarily, how can you hear anything if it's so, so noisy inside? So that's where a lot of the meditation and contemplation approaches are really useful because they allow you to chill out and shut up. <laughs> and then you might be able to hear something. Once, and, and like anything, you know, we make things a habit. That's nature. So just uh, you have to choose. And in a way, it's like what you said, like, if you think it's not possible, then you're already chosen that that's going to be your habit, that you're not going to be talking to plants. But if you choose, I'm going to make a ha a, an habit of mine is going to be to connect with the world and talk to the world and listen back to the world and have this relationship in conversation with constantly in, in conversation with, then don't worry, the world will talk back to you. The plants are so chatty and they're so happy to share that if anything, sometimes I'm passing through and, and sometimes I hear a plant like, oh, you know, you need to talk to us. And I was like, oh, I really don't have time right now. Yeah. Then, it's kind of like, a, look, guys, you know, I'm also doing other things. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. So I think that people can um, easily connect because it's part of our nature. Yeah. There's a couple other things I wanted to throw into the mix here. One, plants like human beings are mostly water. And we know from hard scientific evidence that water has an almost infinite capacity for memory of anything it touches or interacts with. And water is the vehicle that is the interchange between the spiritual realm and the material realm. It's the water in our body that our soul interacts with so that we have a direct connection from the non-local field of spirit to the physical experience of ourselves and our own thoughts and, and our emotions. And it's through prayer, for example, when we're praying, our prayers coming out of our heart and our mind and our thoughts, infusing the water of our, vi our body, which is oscillating in frequency with the vibrational field we would call mind or soul or spirit. So just the fact that we're bringing the water of those plants into us, we're bringing their own intelligence, their own connection to their own soul and their own evolutionary history, and therefore their intelligence into us. And we'll get into this more when we talk about your plant diets, but I think just the water connection, if a person studies water and then you say, okay, wait a minute, you know, what do I bring into my body? Well, almost everything you eat has some degree of water. And if it doesn't, it's probably not food you should be eating anyhow. I tell the pe That's people, right. <laughs> I tell people that one of my rules for food is the longer it lasts on the shelf, the worse it is for you, you know? And so That's right. another concept that I have to credit uh, someone I love very deeply and someone I think you'd be fascinated by, Ibrahim Karim is the founder of Biogeometry and um, I have two podcasts, one with him and his daughter, Doria, who's also a genius, and one with Doria on, on biogeometry. But he brought up a, a point that I, that I 
he was the first one to really make me aware of this, but it was shocking. And I want to share it with you because it's very relevant. He said, you know, Paul, what we people don't realize is that the plant kingdom is actually an external organ for the human body because we cannot photosynthesize. So the plants actually photosynthesize and allow us to draw in the energy and the resources and the nutrition that they create for us because we can't do it. And the whole digestive system is largely on our third chakra. And so really the plant kingdom is sort of the externalization of the solar plexus, which is the plexus. Not only is it a massive plexus, research on the shoulder, solar plexus shows it has more neurons than your entire brain stem and peripheral nervous system combined. So it's a massive, massive collection of neurons. When you consider the heart has something, I don't know, different studies say between 28,000 and 42,000 neurons and the power of the mind of the heart as heart mass research shows is incredible. So when you consider there's billions and billions of neurons in the solar plexus, and that plexus is designed to interface with the plant kingdom because it is the solar plexus. It's the sun plexus, the light plexus. So I, I think that's another perspective. And, and I'm not only sharing that from the perspective of the energetics of it, I'm sharing it from the perspective that when you realize how critical the plant kingdom is to our survival, it becomes evident that we need to be much, much more conscious of how we're managing the soil, what we're putting on plants as far as chemicals, and how we're handling the ecosystem. Because I have a system I teach my students called the ECHO, E-C-H-O, which stands for Energy, Chemistry, Hydration, and Organisms. The, those are the things that life depends on. You can't have life without energy. You can't have life without chemistry. You can't have life uh, without hydration, without water, and you have to eat organisms. So whatever we do to the outer environment alters the energy, chemistry, hydration, and the life of the organisms, which immediately is mirrored back to us. So the more we traumatize the outside environment and the plant kingdom and the animal kingdom, the more we traumatize ourselves. But people have gotten so conditioned to think that food just magically appears in a supermarket and that you can just manufacture it in a laboratory that they've completely and utterly lost connection to the intimate connection we have to nature. I just love it if you share your thoughts on those perspectives. Yeah, beautiful. Um, yeah, lots, lots of food for thought there. Uh, the first thing that comes to mind is actually um, a shift in perspective. And, uh, and I would push what you said even a little touch further. Uh, Good. You know, even, even for us to say that there is uh, a world out there that we need to manage. Just because we need it, you know, I need it. But actually, the world out there, it's already you. You already out there. Yeah. Like, um, there is, you are not, it's the illusion of this self contained, uh, isolated uh, system, which we call this is my body, my person. But the entire system is open. I mean, even the skin, which contains, is a, is a nice bag that contains all of our organs and our bits and pieces. Even the skin is completely open. In fact, so much so that you can do the experiment yourself. You put uh, paint on top and you will be dead in a few hours because you need, you can't breathe. You're breathing through your skin. So everything is porous. Everything is interchanging, exchanging. It's not just the breath. And that's probably why most of the tradition have used the breath as the anchoring point to bring awareness to the body and to the mind. But like the breath is the most obvious because we can really see it and play with it. But deeper than that is like the entire system is just like the breath. The entire system is open. And not only that, but when you connect with that, that literally you feel into that, you realize that there is no place where you are not already. So there is no world out there. 
you are everything that you see. Everything that you experience is you. So even when I speak of like I'm having this conversation with the plant spirit, yes, at one level, but on another level, there is no plant spirit and there is no me. There is just a we, there is a collective, there is an energy that is manifesting as, oh, there is a, what we call the human body here and there is a plant body over there. And uh, so if we take that, perspective then you can also see if you expand it to the planet of, as, as, a, as a whole you can also see that there is not the planet and us <laughs> there is no like you know we are having the cop 26 now and we're gonna waste some more time about talking about things that we are not gonna do because we don't really care enough and uh in general and the truth is like uh, we cannot care because we're still thinking that we need to do something to, to change the climate or to manage the soil or to manage the crisis. The crisis is not a crisis that needs to be managed out there. I mean, of course, action needs to happen. That's not, not in question. But where does the action come from is fundamental because otherwise the same action that we've already taken before are going to come up again. And that uh, inevitably is going to cause the same problem that we are facing over and over again. It's just going to exacerbate. So at the core, we need to really work on where is the action coming from. And if the action is coming from the deep understanding that I'm not trying to save the planet, there is like, I am the planet. I am the earth. The earth is here. And so... When I commit myself to do the right thing for, for the planet, I am committing to do it not for the planet, but for me, but not in a selfish way because I only care about me, but because I have the understanding that I am not, I'm not different from. So, do you know, anytime that we are, uh, we're not, uh, we're abusing the body, it's an abuse of the system, the natural system that it's us. And uh, any time that I think that the earth will sort itself out, correct, which also means, am I sorting myself out? <laughs> any time that I say like, oh, those guys out there are not making the right thing. I'm not committing to the right action. Those governments, you know, they're failing us. It's like, am I failing us? Because there, there is no difference. Like uh, in the moment, the quicker we get to this, and, but not just in words, like it needs to really be embedded. It needs to be an understanding that all, all the cells hold. Then, of course, you're here. Th then you can speak of service, I think. And, of course, what else are we here for if not to serve this magnificent creation, which is, you know, this is one manifestation of. And how incredible that it comes in so many different forms, colors, and crazy stuff. And they look like they're interacting, but really it's just all one big mess that comes out from a big pot and then it goes back into the pot and they get stirred again and comes up in new bubbles and then it goes back into the pot. So I think that from this understanding then also, as we were talking before about the question of, uh, you know, talking to plants, it's like uh, it beca then it becomes a mute question because it's like, uh, but of course, we are the plant that we are talking to. We are, and the plant is this human being. Paleo Valley makes some incredible superfood bars that are a lot different than what most people think of as a superfood bar. I've got Autumn Smith, the creator of their superfood bars, right here to tell you about them. Autumn, what is so unique about your awesome superfood bars? Well, our superfood bars are unique because not only do they not contain refined sugar or GMOs or any of the freaky additives that you'll find in most bars or gluten or anything, but they're just whole foods. They're low in sugar. They're made with superfoods like ginger and broccoli and acerola cherry and 
collagen from grass-fed and finished animals, which we all know is like a fountain of youth. And so the best part about them, though, is probably the flavor. They come in chocolate and apple cinnamon, and we have so many more delicious flavors to come, and they're easy to put in your bag to feed for you with your kids. And I hope you love them all as much as I do. All you have to do to get access is go to paleovalley.com, and you can use the code CHECK15, that's lowercase C-H-E-K, 15, and you can get 15% off. And I hope you love them. That's awesome. And just so you know, that's P-A-L-E-O valley.com. And I know you're going to love Autumn Superfood Bars. An example from my own experience, uh, I went to this meeting. I was invited by some elders to a meeting. And the meeting was taking place in the ca- in a campus, a university campus, so like as Western and standard as you can make it. <laughs> so there was no flash, no spirit, no nothing. Just the, you know, the nice colonial building of big bricks and university uh, institution space. Now, I was uh, traveling from quite far away. So I had, I, I arrived, my plane was delayed and I arrived a touch late. The meeting had already started. So the people that invited me, I didn't have a chance to introduce myself and say hello at the start. So when the meeting finished, I approached to say thank you for the invitation and goodbye. And the person that invited me, uh, you know, was not able to look at me in the face. And so I was like, oh, oh, thank you so much for inviting me. And the meeting was really good. So I was really appreciative. And I said, thank you. I really enjoyed it. And, and this person kept looking down and couldn't look up at me. And I know that in some traditional um, spaces, uh, you know, in, especially in indigenous spaces, that is part of the protocol. So it's like, that's okay. I, I, I didn't take it personal. I just noticed. Uh, then this person sent me an email afterwards. And um, and he said, Do you know, Monica, I'm really sorry that I couldn't look up. But every time that I tried, I kept seeing um, the, your face was changing. And I kept seeing it looked like uh, you were turning to a plant. Different plants were, were becoming your face. And, uh, ah, cool. and I, you know, I smiled with myself because, of course, I have dieted several plants. And I know that I am a collective. I was always a collective, you know, you got bacteria in your guts. You're already a collective by default. But, you know, I am actually engaging uh, purposefully to bring more collective into this physical container. So the fact that someone actually that I've never met could experience that and report it back to me, I always thought I was being very sneaky and very good at hiding that part of me. (laughs) <laughs> and he said, no, that, that expression of this collective came to, so, so obvious that this person wasn't able to look at me in the face because it was so, I guess, uh, disorienting. Yes, shocking. And um, by the way, that's right. But by the way, because of that exchange, which of course of the entire meeting, there was like a five minutes, right? Uh, because of that exchange, I was invited then to go out on country with them. And we had a beautiful sharing. Then, of course, COVID happened and things got slowed down. But there is this beautiful project that we want to develop together with country and uh, in, in a very special spot here in Australia where, you know, there are some really old ceremony still sitting in the land that are wanting to rise up again. And so, yeah, someone actually was able to see the collective that it's here. Yeah, that's really so beautiful. It's not even like you don't even have to sit in ceremony. You know, you can actually do it in the in the middle of a city like Sydney, in the middle of an institutionalized building and at a meeting that is a professional meeting with other academics. Yeah. So <laughs> if it can happen there, it can happen anywhere. <laughs> exactly. And, and, and sometimes, you know, the Zen masters call it the touch. Uh, there's an old saying, Somebody says to the Zen master who's interested in practicing Zen Buddhism, and the, they say to the master, if I study with you, how long will it take to get enlightened? And the master smiles and says, it may take 35 seconds and it may take 35 years. But the point being is this person was at some level ready to see what was really there inside of you 
at that moment in time. And it may that be that they weren't ready to see it. And it needed you to be that coherent in your own presence for that person to actually be able to see what is too discoherent or or chaotic in other people. The, in other words, the images are all over the place. So they wouldn't know what to see. But in you, because it's so coherent, see, when I'm present with you in my third eye, I don't see the plants in your face. I see all around you plant spirits and I, I see jungle images and I see laboratory and I see little plants and pots and they're just piles of them around you, like literally like a van. <laughs> but a couple of comments that I wanted to share, you know, you talk about the skin, a couple of things I tell my students, one little slogan I learned from studying a, a course on nutrition from a guy named David Getoff. He says, if it's on your skin, you're drinking it. and 60% of the chlorine in, in a bathtub or a shower will go right through your skin. And one of the tests that I teach in my holistic lifestyle coach training is an iodine test where you swab the iodine on your skin. And if you're iodine deficient, that red patch will disappear and it goes right into your body. But if you have enough iodine, two or three days later, that red mark's still there from the iodine swab. So there's an easy way to, to, to realize that you're very, very permeable. And, and we know we put all sorts of medicines on our skin and skin creams and steroid creams and all sorts of stuff goes walking right through you and light penetrates you, sound penetrates you, breath penetrates you. I mean, we're as permeable as permeable gets, but that leads me to share a perspective that most people don't think about that I think you would probably enjoy. And that is that there is a necessity for that illusion of separation. There's a necessity for you sitting and saying to the plant spirit, I have my sovereignty, and for you to be working on or for or with the plants. And that necessity of individuality is that we couldn't have love without it. Because if we are in a state of total union, we would not have the ability to actually exchange empathy and compassion and presence with each other. So I think part of what I think is important for people to realize is that it is the act of recognizing the tree as tree, the cat as cat, the dog as dog, the bird as bird. Me is me and Monica's Monica. I can love Monica because I can have a relationship with her. But if she was fused in me, I would be all alone, not realizing Monica was there. So when we realize that the world That's needs right. our love, then, then the individuality becomes a vehicle for the exchange of consciousness. I tell people love is consciousness becoming aware of itself. And individuality is what allows love to have a vehicle of expression. And if we realize that the world is us and we are the world, then you realize how important it is to love the world so that it can love you more effectively. I mean, the world can try to love us, but if we kill all the soil, <laughs> it'll, it, we'll starve to death, but the world will be saying, look, I'm doing my best for you, but you keep stopping me from feeding you. You know, just like if you try to hug somebody that you love and they push you away, well, you can't hug them. But we have to wake up to the fact that, that we are pushing the earth away. We are pushing the plants away. We're pushing the animals away. In fact, uh, you know, I have this later in the, in the show notes, so I won't get into it now. But it's, I think it's very important for us to really come back to the roots of shamanism and the roots of paganism. And that, and that the, the word religion stems from the word religio, which means to link back or connect to. And that's what love is. It's to connect to. I define love as the flow of energy and information through empathic and compassionate connection to self or other. So we need to realize that love is the flow of energy and information, which is spirit itself. And the empathy to feel and compassion to understand is, is, is the bonding force that helps us be interested in each other and feel each other. But if we 
if we keep going down this scientific materialist path, we get further and further into treating the world and plants and living beings as objects that we think are just there for our disposal. But that is a, a one-way love relationship. And that can't work because love is a boomerang. Whatever you put out comes back to you. And if we if we put love, nurture, and care out, then it comes back to us. I think we're at a really important point in history where we have to really become conscious of what love is and how love expresses itself in relationship, not only with people, but with all living beings, because we're actually unconsciously being railroaded through scientific materialism, not to see love around us, but to see objects. I just felt that I needed to share that with you and everybody else, because I think it's something that we really need to wake up to. No, beautiful. And also it just speaks to, like for me, it speaks to the fact that, you know, especially with the the modern scientific paradigm, because it wasn't always this way, uh, the more recent scientific approaches, uh, we are, uh, you know, unidimensional. You know, here is me, here is the object of my study, and that's it. And uh, each one, each component has got one dimension. And if I can work out what that dimension is about, I understood the system. But we, and, ev- and when I say we, is like I refer to the individual self, but also we as the system, like the earth system with all of its uh, species, all of its beauty, all of its waters and all of, all of it. Uh, we are... We live in a multidimensional space. We're not just uh, the one objectifiable system. Uh, and so if we accept that we are multidimensional being, then it's very easy to see how in one dimension you are the individual that um, you know can share with another. And at the same time, you're also already the other. So why wouldn't you love this other, which is you? It's very simple. And, uh, and also, I guess, like, a, what an amazing game that we can play. We, like, the knowing that the other is already you, so you want to offer everything that you have because you're offering to the self, but also pretending that the other is not you. <laughs> and then you can experience what it feels like to give and to receive and to share and to love and all of that. So it's, it's like, I don't, I can't imagine uh, my small mind being able to devise such an incredible game. This is the most incredible hide and seek game ever played. And, um, and we are, it's almost like a, we have decided that we don't want to play. It's almost like, no, I, I don't want to play this game. No, I'm going to reduce the rules and make it really boring. And so, yes. that's when we have like, it's <laughs> and so it is. You over there, you're my enemy. That's right. And it's, it's such a shame because the game is much richer and not only there. And again, this was shared, this was given to me by a plant and, and, um, and it was, you know, there are times when, you know, you look outside and you forget that it's you. <laughs> and, um, and I was like, Oh, the place is so, is everything is so stuffed and how are we ever going to get out of this mess? And, and, um, Nobody cares. There is no enough care and enough love and blah, blah, blah. And one plant was like, well, then you put the love where it's not. You put the care where it's not. You put yourself where it's not. But in that moment of you putting yourself there, it's another way of saying, realize that you are that. So by putting yourself there, you're literally re- reminding yourself that you're already everywhere and that's why you care because, you know, uh, ultimately you are the God creator that is uh, having a nice game down here, like uh, pretending not to be. And, uh, and it's perfect so that it, we can experience all these crazy potentials. So, um, yes. Yeah. With without which source cannot know itself, so we are source exploring That's itself. Right. And and you That's know, right. for people that are religious right. and spiritual, it's important to remember we are doing God's work uh, because we are that. And you know, there's a saying in Hinduism, "Thou right. art that." You know, and that's important 
for people to remember. And I think, I think the shaman had a much stronger handle on that. And the medicine people of other cultures had a much stronger handle on that. There's lots of things I want to ask you about, but maybe if you don't mind just to set us up for the next question, could you share one or two other things that you've learned from your uh, plant medicine ceremonies where you had experiences like you talked about with the ayahuasca? And what I'm trying to lay the groundwork for here is how the the medicine experience opened your consciousness to help you transform your limitations. Hmm. Well, maybe I'll, uh, I'll actually share something that happened very recently. And, um, well, two things, actually. It's like uh, I have recently moved to this uh, property where I'm renting. And, uh, and almost from the beginning, it felt like uh, I knew it was a, a transition space. I wasn't here for very long. But, of course, that, you know, in my little self, I'm like, uh, not very long, it's okay, but not just a few months, right? <laughs> like, because as anybody knows, like moving home, no matter moving, how yeah. happily you do it, even at the vet, yeah, it's always stressful and, uh, and it demands a lot of energy. So, so I, I moved here and, and it took me a while to ground. And, and then after a while, I realized, oh, wow, okay, so this is just a transition. We are actually, this is not the destination. This is only like a station that I'm having a stop by. And, and um, and I was looking at, my, at the plants, my plants, which are now all in pots because, uh, you know, I, I don't want to leave. I, I had to leave many of them behind over the years. And I just feel like, no, some of these, we are one one and the same. So we are all moving. <laughs> so I put them in pots and they're doing fine. But over the last few months, they've been recurrently reminding me that I am in a pot too. And uh, and so every time that I've been feeling uneasy and I feel like uh, uh, frustrated or anxious even, it's because I'm inside a pot and you're not meant to stay in a pot for too long. You know, otherwise, like any plants, it, you know, it, it needs to go in the ground. And so... That was the first, the beginning. It's like, okay, my plants are screaming to me that they need to go to in the ground. And I realized because of their sharing that I need to find my own ground where I can put my roots. And um, and literally from one day to the next, it became very clear that the next step for me uh, is to, yeah, is to find a, a, a ground, a physical land where I can put my roots down and my plants can put their roots down. The very moment I realized that and I started engaging with that vision, um, my plants, which have done nothing for months, just sitting there, survive, like, you know, they're alive, but they haven't grown anything, no new shoots, no nothing. <laughs> Suddenly, within two weeks, I had tendrils that were like meter logs, and it's almost like, okay, she got it. We are moving and we're going to find home. And then, uh -huh. we can, and, and all, there is this feeling of excitement. And I had to, my, my vine, I had to, you know, bend the vine onto itself and remind her that, you know, soon, but can you contain a little bit for a little while longer because we're not there yet. And, um, <laughs> but there is this exuberance of life knowing that, yeah, we're moving in the right directions and she got it. She got it. You know, that's what I could hear. Then, uh, just a couple of weeks ago, um, we were sitting here uh, with a very beautiful ceremony for the new moon, which, of course, is also uh, a time for the new uh, vision to arise, new beginnings. And, and uh, yeah, and as I was sitting there, it was a beautiful space, very peaceful, very, very calm. And then suddenly I saw myself... In a very, very strong physical way, I saw myself, I was looking through the eyes of myself as a bird. And I was flying really fast through this land. And I saw these two mountain peaks and a white house in the middle of like super green and lush. And it, there was this white house on the left hand side. And as I was watching these 
of myself traveling through this space, I asked the plant, uh, in this case with the cacao, and I asked the plant, what is this? And I just got like almost a green light to say, what do you think it is? And in that moment, I knew it's like, oh my God, this is what I'm looking for. This is the land where I need to go and put my roots down and all my plants. <laughs> and, uh, so um, I have had uh, visions and dreams before or places that I'm supposed to find that they are for me to look for. And, uh, and they're actually in this reality, although they've been presented in you know, dreams or visions. And so there was the same feeling of like this place actually really exists. And this is where I need to, I need to find it because this is where we are going. And, um, and then the next day, a friend of mine came and we were just, uh, we were gathering to, to play some music together. And as we are chatting, I'm sharing this vision with her. And, and she just pulls out her phone and she said, like, have you seen this place? And the logo for this place, it was two mountains and a little house right on the left hand side, a white little house at the left hand side. And I'm like, wow, where is this? And she was like, just up the road, you know? And I'm like, oh my God. And, and she said, it's for sale. <laughs> and I was like, okay. And so I engaged into, you know, like, okay, I'm going to see if I can contact the owner and see, you know, all of that. And for a week, I couldn't get through. And eventually, when I got through, uh, the owner said to me, like, uh, well, you know, last week, so that needed to happen before we could talk. Last week, the elders came to visit and they told me what this land wants next. And, and, you know, and they explained that this is their vision. This is what the land is asking. And I, I want to sell the property because we want to move, but uh, I also want to honor that the land has got its own vision and I want to find the right person. And, uh, and then I just, I just couldn't believe it. And I described what I was seeing, what I saw in my vision and what I was envisioning to do. And the two were not even like a perfect match. It was almost like the same. It was the land was dreaming something and it was bringing the people that he needs to, to bring a vision alive. And so it really felt like, okay. We'll have to engage with this. You know, obviously this is where we are going and, uh, and so I wanted to share this because this is an example of how some of the work with the plants can be very personal and very much like about your own little shadows and the little corners that, you know, the little old habits that are kind of blocking us from becoming really fully who we are and expressing ourselves. But often, at least for me, often they are very instructional. You know, and they're like, okay, do this, find this place, do that, and you connect with this, and this is how it looks. And, and it's so clear that then it's actually very easy to, ah, that's the place. In this reality, the place that I saw in that, in that vision or in that dream is actually over here. And uh, the same way I arrived in Peru the very first time when I, when I went to do my first dieta, I had a dream, three dreams. And actually, this is described in the book, is I had three dreams showing me exactly the place, exactly the, the, the hat where I was going to be sitting. And, uh, and you know, it, it was on the other side of the world. I never really had any particular interest in going to South America or Peru. And suddenly I'm like, oh, I found it and I'm buying a ticket and I'm going and I have no idea why. <laughs> so. <laughs> yeah, that's really beautiful. Hi, everybody. One of my all-time favorite enzyme products in the world, bar none, is Masszymes from Bioptimizers. This is a broad-spectrum enzyme that works amazingly well, but since Wade Lightheart is co-founder of Bioptimizers and knows the intimate details of it, I wanted Wade to let us know how it is that Masszymes works so well. Wade, how does this product work so well? Well, first and foremost, it combines 17 different enzymes, including five different types of proteolytic enzymes, which work in the full spectrum, anywhere from two pH of two to a pH of 12. So it'll cover all your bases on whatever your digestive or dietary needs are. We also combined it with an enzyme enhancer called Astrazyme, which improves enzymatic function by 30 to 60 percent. There's no weird additives or flow regulators inside of it. And our recent research in our university lab in Europe has proven that it also produces antioxidants inside the body, which makes it doubly incredible. 
That's an amazing product, and I use it every day. I take five in the morning and five at night, and in the morning I throw two Capex in just to give a little energy magic, and it's absolutely amazing. I feel fantastic, and even as a guy that's about to turn 60, I can still put it on the young guys. So thank you, Bioptimizers. To try Masszymes for yourself, go to Masszymes, M-A-S-S-Z-Y-M-E-S dot com forward slash living number four, capital D, and enter the code capital P, capital A, capital U, capital L, 10, that's Paul in all caps with a 10 behind it, to get 10% off this product and any other Bioptimizers products you'd like. And of course, Masszymes comes with Bioptimizers 100% money back guarantee. So there is no risk if you don't like it. Just send it back and you'll get your money back. Enjoy. I've had a long string of very similar experiences and I'll share one with you. Uh, we we knew we needed to move uh, because we were spending a lot of money. I used to have an office. It was in a big house on top of a mountain next to a lake. Very beautiful. But it was costing me a lot of money. So the combined amount of money we were paying for my office and our house was enough to buy a really nice property. Well, the long story is it took us five years to find the right place. But we had seen this place about three years earlier, and it was just way too expensive for us. It was $3.9 million, but we saw it. We we're like, oh, my God, that's our place. Look at that. But then we like, we can't carry a mortgage that big. So many serendipitous and strange synchronicities happened. And three years later, the girls are out shopping, and they happen to see an open house sign. And they thought, well, why not just go have a look? They didn't even know where it was at. They were just about to get on the freeway to come back from house shopping. And it was the place we'd been looking at. But in the three years, it had dropped down almost $2 million. And so one thing led to another. So we bought the place, and many strange things happened. For example, I painted a mandala and I go into meditation each year and have my soul give me a vision for the year. And I painted a symbol of the uh, of a Native American Indian sun face, the sun face figure that like the sun with feathers radiating out. And when the girls got here to see the place on the front gate is about a five foot mandala with exactly that image on it. And Angie was like, oh, my God, look, Penny, look. That's what Paul just painted on his mandala. So we got here and there was so many wild things that happened. I was out walking the property. We have 14 acres and, and I just connected my heart and soul to the land. And I said, I had a funny feeling you guys were involved in getting us here. Were, were you trying to get us here? And they said, yes, we've been working on it for three years. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. <laughs> That's right. I mean, I have had a dream of this place uh, maybe 10 years ago. And I knew that it would be, it was a dream that I, I was, I could see the, the trees. I was lying on the ground and I could see the trees. And I knew that I would know where the place was once I would see, re see again that image. And, um, yeah, and as I was walking through this property, when because I did go and, and see the place for real, and, uh, yeah, and there it was, the tree, a eucalyptus, and I thought, ha-ha. <laughs> and like you, at the moment for, for us, uh, the prices here in Australia are going absolutely beyond disgraceful. Like, they're so ridiculous. And so... This property, uh, it's uh, like financially speaking, for me, it's impossible. But um, I am also a specialist on uh, impossibilities. <laughs> so, yeah, well, you who knows, right? And so, you know, I'll say some. Yeah. yeah. Well, Aubrey, Aubrey Hepburn says, nothing's impossible. The word itself says, I'm possible. <laughs> That's right. So, um, and I think, you know, as often is the case, uh, you know, especially when there are such big visions, 
they they just want to make sure that you're really onto it. They just want to make sure that, did you really get the message here? Is it clear, the job? And uh, yeah. so all of those obstacles, are, you know, are, are really checkpoints. I understand that. Sometimes I lose and I'm like, I don't understand. I don't understand. You know, I'm supposed to be doing this and how, how do you want me to do this? And and then, yeah, and then I, it comes down to like this deep trust that everything is orchestrated so that everything can flow exactly as it's meant to and needed to, to serve the bigger picture. So, yeah, if this is the place as I saw it, as I was given, uh, it will find its own magical way to, to, to find itself arriving and hosting me and the dreams that I need to create there, or I should say co-create there with the land and those ones that are already living there, all of the trees and there is lots of animals and yeah. So yeah, one of those uh, practical instructional moments with the plants where it's like, oh, this and I had plenty more, of course, they have instructed my science and, uh, you know, I had very clear instructions of experiments that then I went in the lab and, and you know, tried to do them and get, also got that moment of crisis of like, what am I doing? I'm actually setting up something thinking, oh, the plant said to do it this way. And, you know, you that moment when you're like, are you stupid <laughs> or what? It's like, what are, what are you talking about? <laughs> and then actually that is exactly how it worked it's like uh in the midst of chaos <laughs> exactly light persists right so it's like uh the light of the plants is um despite my own resistance to it despite my own like uh nah come on no that's not how we're doing it and then it's like yeah that's how we're doing it and and to me i i think you know, I it just, it's just been teaching me that, um, I, I, I'm, yeah, I don't even know how to say this, but it's, it's basically like, uh, this is how we, we are. This is how I am, at least. And I believe that we all are, uh, you know, a blend of all these bodies of knowing. And, uh, and I refuse to operate in a way that shrinks it down to just, uh, very superficial little parts and of course from a career perspective this is a uh, very dangerous territory as you can imagine but i have i'm prepared to to lose everything i have already done it once or twice so it's like uh, okay if that's what the cost is and then what i learned as well that whatever i fear the most in that situation of losing my my job and losing my career in reality is just a renewal and my job uh, transforms itself and it becomes something else that actually then delivers really what was needed. And um, yeah, if I think about the experiments that I've done with plants, I think, you know, if you would have asked me like uh, uh, 10 years earlier, I would have laughed really loud and I would have been like, there is no way. And, uh, and probably that's how, you know, my future self was talking to me then, say like, you know, we will do all of this crazy stuff. And my past self would have been like, no, that, that's not, that's not true and yet. Well, you know, there's a beautiful saying by Joseph Campbell. You've probably heard it for, before, but I think it's appropriate right now. He says, the cave you fear to enter holds the treasure you need the most. Mm -hmm. That's right. <laughs> yeah. You know, th this conversation has set us up perfectly for my next question, which is, Going back to the problem of, of this sort of left brain dominance, if you can't weigh it or measure it, it doesn't exist, concept of science that, that's, I think, really dangerous to the planet right now. My question for you is this, what do you think would happen if we could get a significant number of leading scientists to do a properly run medicine ceremony like ayahuasca or uh, medicinal mushrooms so that they can actually break through their left brain and meet their right brain and, and have some of these experiences of meeting their deeper self. What do you think would happen to the field of science? Um, well, it will be inevitably transformed. Uh, but if I had to, uh, <laughs> yeah. if I had just one shot and I had to do that uh, experiment, like, 
which people would I really bring to that ceremony? It wouldn't be the scientists. The scientists in the end are just like, you know, like most other people. I just, you know, they are clinging on to the grants and the tenure that they have, the position, and they need to pay the mortgage and get the kids to school. They're just like, you know, uh, they're not superhumans or anything. Uh, Most are not particularly interesting in any special way. And I'm not saying this in a patronizing tone, but it's just like, you know, they're just uh, as any other profession, you know, it's just the business as usual. And this is the kind of business the scientists have. But um, and that's why I guess uh, you know throughout the history of science as well we um, we glorify innovation and pioneering and new bright ideas. But the truth is that they don't fit very well with the system. The system wants business as usual, and so most people uh, wants to fit in the system. So they probably have the most brilliant mind if they allow themselves to to really unleash. But uh, the system wouldn't be um, giving space for that. So, and it connects as well with what you were saying before about this idea of the individual and like individuality, as well as knowing that you are everything. It's the same. It's like, uh, well, if we want the pioneers, we also need the rest. Because otherwise, what would a pioneer do? If everyone was a pioneer, then we wouldn't need a pioneer. <laughs> So I guess the system is set up as a polarity and the problem is when we are really believing that the polarity is what this space, the entire space is about. And uh, polarity is just one of the rules of the game, but it's one of them. It's not the rule. And um, so I, in that context, I wouldn't probably bring the scientists in that ceremony. I would bring those that um, we... Uh, you know, in general, we point the finger to when things go wrong. And and I would bring in the politicians, all of the state of government, and I would bring those in because yeah, they are in would, a position where the their trend. job is to, yeah, their job is to look after the country. And um, so it's like, okay, so maybe someone can show you how to do that. And maybe it can show you where your values really are and what the priority really are. And uh, and I suspect that uh, this has happened already to many of them, and that's probably also why they are fighting for a different cause that is not necessarily the one that supports uh, the mining and the destructions of uh, of the planet, and it's a uh, you know a neoliberal uh, capitalistic approach that only cares about uh, the capital. And uh, instead of caring about, there is nothing wrong with money, but is uh, if that is the only priority. Uh, then it, it's like anything; it's not balanced. So that's who I would bring in. <laughs> yeah, well, that's a great idea. There's an old saying that's very powerful: it's very hard to change a person's belief system when their paycheck depends on it. That's right. That's right. Which actually reminds me again of what my grandma. You know, we shared. I shared at the beginning how my grandma was very adamant about. You know, the people can offer a gift of thank you and but don't you can't pay for this and it's funny because this has been translated again amongst the various things that i received from her unknowingly and uh and you know i open the space here at least once a month sometimes more and wherever i am if i can i open the space for people to come and sit uh whether it's meditation or with the plants or whatever and um and you know, in a world of everything is uh, has got a price tag, uh, people are surprised when I, when they say, "So, what is the what is the charge for the evening?" Or what is? And it's like uh, you couldn't afford it even if you wanted to. Nobody can afford <laughs> this, so there is no charge. Although there is a price, no. and the price is for you to show up fully, to be present fully, to commit to what is being shared with you. And if the plants or whatever you know spirit. That gives you a job. The charge is that you follow through. Otherwise, what are we doing? Our, otherwise, yes, go and pay somewhere else, enjoy the evening, and forget about it afterwards. And that is nice entertainment, but it doesn't change the world. And right now, I think we had plenty of entertainment, <laughs> and it's yeah, time to change the world. 
That's right. And it's like that, changing the world doesn't have to be bad. It doesn't have to be boring. Does it, it can be amazingly and it, can, it should be fun. We're going to get to create, but we need to engage with this. And that's the idea. I think one of the problems is that what we call entertainment is now scientifically co-opting people's minds as entrainment. <laughs> that's right. Yep. I call it, it ent entertainment. <laughs> yes, we do. Well, th this has led us to a really important part of the interview. I've sort of set the stage now. I'd love it if you could share whatever rises up in you that you have learned from the plants about plant consciousness through your research. So could you share some of the like real, oh my God, epiphany moments where you were taught things by the plants that showed you that they are definitely not just the kind of numb little creatures that grow out of the ground and don't have thoughts or consciousness that most people tend to think that they are. Hmm. Give it, well, in other I words, guess... tell us, how conscious are they really? And how <laughs> did you figure it out? Well, um, I guess the... Um... I can share how one of my experiments came about because it's the one that for me was the most, uh, in a way, challenging, transformational. It also demanded of me to be really open to everything and all possibilities. So I was, uh, I was in Peru uh, and I was doing a dieta with a plant that actually is about the mind. And... Um, and during the dieta, one day, I never really uh, keep a diary except when I travel. I don't know why. So when I travel, I diary every day, pages and pages. When I'm at home, although lots of stuff happens all the time, I don't diary. Anyway, so I have my travel diary and all of my dieta, are actually, when I do a dieta, I, I, I do write down. And uh, so all my entire dieta phase was in this uh, booklet, actually. I got one here. Oh, you can't see because we are only on voice. But there are all these red yeah, little yeah. books. Yeah, they and look anyway, like moleskin the, books. They are, actually. They are little red moleskin. And, uh, and I got a pile of them because of all the work that uh, has happened. And and uh, so I'm scribbling in my uh, in my little red book, and uh, and at one point I felt I'm in the midst of my dieta, so I'm in isolation. I'm you know I'm just uh, basically deeply in communion with this uh, space where the plant is, and and um, and at one point I felt like as if someone else was dictating, and I was just taking you know down notes of someone else's speaking. And uh, and it wasn't just uh, speaking, but it was actually oh, draw this diagram like this and do it like that, and and so my diary is full of these diagrams and and these uh, oh, this is how many times you need to do that, and then you move that to that, and uh, instructions, and uh, and when I finished, and the you know the the that moment closed itself, I looked at what was left in my pages, and I was like, what's this? And then one more little thing came through and it was like uh, oh and by the way not sunflowers peas and i was like what <laughs> so now what happened was that a couple of years before i went to do this dieta i was trying to do an experiment in the lab with sunflower seeds and uh and seedlings and i was hoping to see whether i could yeah uh, test whether these plants could uh, respond to conditioning, talking about entrainment, uh, to conditioning, a little bit like the same experiments that Pavlov did with the dog. And, um, and in the Pavlovian experiment with the dog, you know, the famous story goes that Pavlov rings the bell and then he offers the dog dinner and then he does it repeatedly. And then after a while, the dog, the bell doesn't mean anything to start with, but after a while, the dog learns that Whenever the bell goes, the dinner is about to follow. And so it starts salivating, even if dinner is nowhere to be seen. So the bell itself has acquired a meaning and it induces the dog to connect that sound to what he wants, dinner. Now, so what the plant had given me, what this plant had given me during the dieta was the design to test for Pavlovian learning. And so when I went back home after Peru and, uh, 
and I had these pages and they were just haunting me. It was like, I have to try it. It's, I know it sounds crazy, but I have to try it. I have to try it. So I booked the lab, the lab space, and I set it up as the plants asked and I fiddle around a little bit. And then I started running the experiment. And uh, and one thing, like, it wouldn't it be nice if the story goes, that, like, you run the experiment, it works, amazing, success. And instead, I ran the experiment, and two weeks in, and this was a very demanding experiment because it was done in the dark, it was done in the cold, and it was done at horror hours. I had to be there every morning by 6 o'clock, and it would be a long day to follow these plants and make sure that everything was switching on and off at the right time. And Anyway, two weeks in, and I realized that, it looked like it wasn't working. So it was like, because this, the study itself was so demanding as well of my time and my energy, I thought, uh, you're an idiot. You thought that the plant, you, you went to Peru, you thought that the plant gave you the way of doing this experiment and how romantic. And then you come <laughs> back and you actually follow through, how romantic. And, and then it doesn't work. <laughs> So I was like, uh, you know, I was, of course, a little bit disappointed, but in the fact that it's like, uh, oh, it would have been nice if it worked. What a beautiful story. But then science is also demanding, like, okay, it didn't work. And maybe this, the plants cannot do. That's it. And that's the result. It's like, okay, I tested it. It doesn't work. End of the story. So I had decided, and it happened, and this is also described in the book, I had decided that I was going to go in on a Sunday and uh and just clear up the space you know close down the lab switch on all the lights turn everything off and um so i went in and uh and a voice inside me said like just give it another look check one more time and i was like why we already decided it's not working and so i peeped into this uh, setup and and, you know, the only light, this is, again, it's all in the dark, and the only light that it's on is this little blue light, you know, which is what I used as an alternative to dinner in the context of the Pavlovian learning. So the blue light was the dinner for my plant, and instead of the bell, I had a little fan. So I'm looking in, and there is this little blue light on, and the little plant at the bottom, and then suddenly I saw it, and it was like, uh, they're doing it. They've been doing it all along. And I just could not see it. My training was in the middle between me and my scene to the point that like, I've been trained to expect things to happen in a particular way. To, and, and because of that, I cannot see when they are happening, just they're happening slightly different than what I expected. And so I'm in this lab and suddenly I'm seeing the plants actually, they have been doing exactly what I was testing for. And I was about to dismantle everything and never find out that they actually could have done exactly what I was testing for, but I couldn't see it. And that little moment that is one of those moments that feels like it could have been hours and it could have been seconds, who knows? But it was like, oh my God. And I remember crying. It was just like, I was so overwhelmed by like, oh my God, the plant gave me the instructions. I followed through. I followed through to the point of having to meet the real obstacle to this. It wasn't the plants. It wasn't the instruction was wrong. It was my own conditioning and my, in this case, my own professional training and, uh, and having to, you know, bump against it, crack through and see that on the other side, actually everything was just working perfectly fine. And, uh, so then of course, after those, that moment, uh, what followed was like months <laughs> of actual, okay, now I know there is something here. And so repeat, 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 try other, these other control, repeat. And then, you know, and then is the science and then is the beautiful, um, scientific approach at its best. You know, it's a method. It approaches the question. It's go its own way of setting the, the rules and the boundaries so that you can actually say something and the data can speak. And, uh, and so in that sense, this for me was the, you know, the most beautiful moment for my career up to this moment, because it really showed me how these two bodies of knowing are not absolutely not in uh, opposition. If anything, they complement each other perfectly and they can blend into each other. And 
What it means is the science doesn't have to be done just by the human scientists, but it can be done in collaboration with others. In this case, if I work with plants, I can collaborate with plants. And so my science after that, um, and actually I just finished writing this paper and it should be coming out soon. It's about uh, an experiment that apparently failed. <laughs> uh, and But yet it was because the failure was because I wasn't listening to the collaboration that was called in for. And the collaboration was, was between me the plants that were involved in the experiments and even the space, the materials and the space that contained us as the experiment. And so, and in that moment, I really learned to let go of my need to have to know in advance and having this expected outcome, which is what, you know, we are all kind of used to because everything is about, you know, we write a grant and it's like, what are the expected outcomes of this project? Or we, we do anything, a business, and like, what are the expected outcomes from this business to be called successful? And instead, what I'm learning is that I, if I already know what the expected outcomes are by definition, because they are expected, there's nothing new. If I can already expect something, it's because it's nothing new. And uh, and I'm not here to waste my time doing something that we already know. I'm here to bring something new and to be really new. It needs to be unexpected. I, I cannot anticipate it. I can only approach with this not knowing and allow this space to be filled by the thing that really needs to arise in that in that container. And they cannot arise unless the space is given. And so... In a way, this has changed a lot my science, obviously, and uh, and I'm not sure there is really a space in current academia for this kind of science. But talking about when you mentioned before a more conscious science, I think for me, this is my way of trying to get there. Did you know that symbiotica means harmony? And... You're really likely to enjoy my podcast with Shervine Jaffariah, the founder of Symbiotica. Symbiotica is an amazing company that makes excellent products to aid healing, enhance longevity, and improve performance at all levels of your being, from your spiritual practices to your athletic endeavors. I highly recommend you go to symbiotica.com and check out their top-notch organically sourced products that include excellent tasting supplements like their Synergy Vitamin B12, which elevates energy naturally, to their Sheila J Minerals, which help you better regulate your hormonal system. Their Biocharge Activated Coconut Charcoal is an excellent detox support and removes toxins and poisons from the body quickly and non-invasively. Their organic longevity formula is one of my friends and students' favorites. They rave about it. I really enjoy their Regenesis Liposomal Glutathione for its amazing antioxidant powers, which is really helpful for anyone that enjoys vaporizing tobacco and herbs like I do. They also have great immune support products, water filtration options for drinking and showering, and some cool clothing and more. When you go to C-Y-M-B-I-O-T-I-K-A dot com and use your Living 4D discount code, which is capital C, capital H, capital E, capital K, 15 on checkout, you get 15% off anything they sell and you won't be disappointed. Enjoy Symbiotica. One thing I would love to hear a little bit about, because aren't you the first scientist in the world to prove scientifically that plants communicate through sound? Because that, that was an interesting part of your book. I, I was just riveted when you were talking about that. Yeah, well, um, the, it's, again, another interesting story because uh, when I approached the, uh, that question, uh, the question arise uh, from different directions. On one side, I was uh, getting interested in, um, in plants from, you know, a uh, medicine perspective and and, you know, so there is a lot of information. And again, this is now quite mainstream, but the entire idea of the Icaros, so the songs that shamans, especially the curanderos uh, in, South, in some of the parts of South America, uh, claim to receive from the plants. And then they use these songs and these sounds to heal the, the human, uh, the human body. Uh, that was really fascinating to me. 
Uh, and also because I'm not a plant biologist, I, I'm, a, I'm trained as an animal ecologist. What it was fascinating to me was that in the animal field of research, sound and the this exploitation of sound by different species is uh, like, yeah, everyone is doing that. There is so much. I mean, like just think about uh, from dolphins to birds to the, uh, the tapping sounds of spiders to fish. There is everything there. And yet in plants, the entire area had been left kind of Ooh, don't don't touch that. That it's hippie stuff from the sixties and seventies, and do not touch that, or you might actually compromise your career. So uh, yeah, I don't know. Maybe I'm one of those moths around the fire. It's like, oh, excellent. So I want to know about this. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and yes. So this is this is kind of how I got curious. It was like, well, on one side you have these. Uh, Indigenous understanding of uh, the acoustic relationship between the human and the plant, so through sound. And then on the other side, you have this, uh, this fear by modern science to even touch that subject. And what we have from the past is uh, this uh, suggestion uh, that actually maybe there is something true about this. And so I was like, okay, this needs to be approached very scientifically. Otherwise, it's yet another pseudoscience, another hippie exploration or new age, whatever. And science will definitely push me out and, and you know, throw me in a corner. And this, again, will actually not support the, the cause because it will, uh, it will yeah, ger- uh, ma- uh, marginalize the topic even more. So I felt there was a great responsibility to make sure that this was done as scientifically as we could, as uh, rigidly as we could, in a way. But what informed me, it was for me to keep and, and, you know, kind of leave it out of the picture until it was time. So so the first step for me was, well, first of all, I want to know uh, what's this story about these uh, curanderos getting the songs from the plants. And, um, and I guess yeah, the only I way for me great. to know... Well, the only way to know is to go and find out yourself, right? You have to go and have the experience. So uh, this is how I also end up, ended up in Peru and, uh, and started exploring that aspect of, uh, okay, so and so talking to the, the medicine man that I was working with, I was like, so tell me, how does it feel? What, what is your experience? How do you use it? How does it work? How, 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 how? <laughs> And then coming back to the lab and asking those same questions, but in a scientific way. And I was, um, I wrote a, a review, just putting it out there as a, as a possibility. And again, using the a scientific logic or trying to describe why it would make sense to explore the question in the first place. And then I was very lucky because um, I was visiting Europe and I collaborated with some colleagues who works, uh, they work with sound on other areas of, you know, they work primarily with animals and particularly insects. And uh, and so in collaboration with them, we were able to have the right technology and the right courage, I guess, to try it. And what happened is that when you try, sometimes you actually find things. You find exactly what you were looking for. <laughs> yeah. And so that's what yep. happened is like... Um, we we were using laser technology and uh yeah and we were able to see that you know the signal coming out of the plant uh and it was, this is like in a completely soundproof uh, booth and the technology is very sensitive and uh yeah it was just like uh, this is definitely something that the plant is emitting how it's a different question how is doing that? It, obviously, plants don't have like vocal cords; they don't have ears. But yet, there was no doubt, and there is no doubt, the plants are using sound in their life. And then after that, I did other experiments, and not just me. From then, other people have started doing other experiments, and maybe you have come across some of these, where you know, I, I looked at the relationship of the sound of water and plants, and our roots might use it to direct the the growth and. But other colleagues have shown how, you know, plants can use it to, for defense. Uh, so to kind of get ready if there is the sound is giving away the presence of a potential predator. Or in another situation, for example, they can use the sound to, um, to regulate themselves and make themselves even more attractive to pollinator. And so like increasing the amount of sugar in the, in the flowers so that 
when bees arrive, they are more, you know, appealing. But they do it because the, of the sound of the bees approaching before the bees arrive. So it is the sound that is telling the plant, hey, bees over here, put your sugars up so that, you know, they might come to us. So, and I feel the, this area is just going to just grow exponentially, you know. Now, when I started, uh, you know, 10 years ago, it was, uh, I don't know how many eyebrows I saw lifting. <laughs> and, and some people, yeah. as you already know, some people kind of uh, either very dismissive or uh, simply like, uh, if we just ignore it, if you just like pretend that she's not here, uh, everything will be fine. <laughs> and uh, and now, of course, as is the story <laughs> of science. But it is the history of science. Like first, they will, those are the first impression, like before they try to ignore you, then they uh, they will attack you. And then they will say that we always knew that. And he's like, okay, we always Well, here it is right on my wall. I have a poster right here. I've had it for about 30 years. It's a picture of Albert Einstein. And it says, great spirits. Uh, great spirits have always encountered violent opposition from mediocre minds. <laughs> and and the, the other one is first. First, all new ideas are violently opposed, then they are used with scorn, and then they are accepted as though they always existed. That's right. Now, wasn't, if I remember right from your book, it's, it's, it's been a while since your book came out and I went through it, but was it the corn plant that you first picked up the sounds on? It was. Yeah. Yeah, and it was. Did you, uh, maybe it was you, but I thought I actually saw a video somewhere. I might be wrong because I study so much it starts to stream together. But wasn't the sounds they were making like a clicking sound? It was. That's right. Yeah, very, very interesting. And and you know, you know, I I have a lot of profound experiences like that, just laying in nature, and uh, I love to use various plant medicines because they really hop up your perceptual faculty and break down the default mode network so your unconscious is much more available to your conscious awareness and and so i use that for for growing my own awareness and i teach people if you use plant medicines properly they'll actually teach you all sorts of stuff and then you don't need the medicines you know like once you learn to talk to plants if you use a little marijuana or something and then you don't need it anymore because you know it's hap it's happening, and so now you you just get rid of the training wheels and you're off to the races. Um, one of the studies that I came across recently, which was quite mind blowing, I was doing research. Actually, I was searching for information on non locality because I'm writing about non locality in my new book, but I was trying to find ways to explain it to people in terms they could understand. And I just happened to be searching on Google Images, and I saw this picture of a plant sitting in the room and it was like one of those kind of like videos that plays a little bit by itself in a loop and I saw the light jumping around the room and it was like a time-lapse video I thought so I was drawn to it and I clicked on it and it was a research study where they were using a random event generator, which as you know is based on static discharge and so it's 50% chance of anything happening. So they used the random event generator to control the lights so that the lights would never be in any one given place in the room. And they put a plant in the corner of the room and they monitored it. And lo and behold, they found with very strong statistical probability that the plant was changing the random event generator so that it was shining more light on the plant so it could get what it needed, <laughs> which, which beautiful. was really beautiful. So. I, I thought, well, they, if that's not a, a scientific demonstration that a plant is conscious, then nothing is. But one of the things that came to my mind, knowing I was going to be interviewing you, when I saw that, I thought, oh, I got to talk to Monica about this. I'm curious just to hear your thoughts, if you have any. How in the world do you think a plant can control a random event generator? Well, first of all, I would say I would need to see the study. Here is my science act coming on. As I would need to see the study because uh, there is uh, a really deep desire 
for both plant communicability with us so they can talk to us. And also we deeply want to see them as alive and conscious and, and that's great. But, um, I feel like, uh, this Western mind actually, and that's probably why science still has a powerful voice is like, it does need the science to, to, to allow it to create a container, uh, for, for the change, the change of mind. And so I'm always very, um, you know, cautious when I see these kind of things because I, I want to see the actual work um, before I, you know, I can say anything. So uh, there are lots of experiments and, you know, this is great, but I just, uh, yeah, I can't really speak to it. I think conceptually, though, it goes back to what you said and what we talked about. The illusion of separation is the illusion, and therefore the plant is the random event generator. It is the room, and it is the scientist doing the experiment. And since their intention was to see if the thing could do it, they already basically had interacted with the experiment, out. which quantum physics shows beyond a shadow of a doubt. If the researcher already has an outcome in mind, then they've already altered the experiment just by having the intention. And that's one of the magic uh, findings of quantum physics that I think, one, if you haven't read or listened to the audio book, um, Quantum Revelation by Paul Levy, it's absolutely stunningly beautiful. And uh, I, I've podcasted with him. It's a great podcast. And he's just a really cool, amazing guy. But his book is really all about what does quantum physics tell us about us? And it's actually beautiful and mind blowing. And it really goes a lot into the power of intention and how it affects everything, you know? And, and so, you know, I just think that there's so much for us to look into. Monica, one of the notes I took from your book amongst the many was very, very powerful. It said, all stories are luminous threads that weave the tapestry of life. And having spent a lot of time over many years studying mythology, I thought that was a very profound statement. One of the most beautiful definitions of myth I got was when I interviewed James Carse, who was just a mind-blowingly deep and beautiful man. He wrote a book called Finite and Infinite Games. It's just unbelievably powerful. Unfortunately, I had a second interview set up with him, but he died before our second interview. He was about 87 or 88. And unfortunately, at the time of the interview, he had cancer, but he was just sharp as a razor. You would never know that he was that old or that he was suffering from cancer. But he defined a myth as a story that tells itself. And I think if a person meditates on that, it's it, it can take you into a very deep com com uh, contemplative exploration. So what that made me want to talk to you about was if you look at the mythologies of no nomadic cultures, and then you look at the mythologies of agrarian cultures, they're very different. The core underlying themes of birth, life, death, regeneration, they're there. But the way they go about their practices of worship, their belief about uh, killing, and many other things are quite different. But the agrarian culture grew into what we know as agriculture, which came with uh, segregation, the building of fence, the development of militaries to protect food supplies and lands. And that's when people started getting very territorial. So with that sort of preface, I would love to hear your thoughts on what you think the myth that we're living today is, because I think most people today are very unconscious of myth. In fact, standard education and Western science has basically trained the public to think that myth is equivalent to a lie or a story that's not true, which is just so dangerously, dangerously wrong. Um, but with the issues going on in the world today and all the issues of our destruction of nature, how do you, what do you feel our myth is that we're living out unconsciously? And what are your thoughts on how we, we could maybe start emptying emptying ourselves to be more open to 
a, a myth that's more in harmony with nature right now. Like we have to empty ourselves to listen to the plants. Cause I personally feel that we're really pushing uh, the, our, our life support system or what the Buddhists call the great chain of being uh, to a dangerous point. And, you know, all behaviors are really the result of beliefs and, and myths are conscious or unconscious beliefs. So I, I think we're, we're, we're in a very dangerous situation. So to restate the question, what do you think the myth is that we're living unconsciously? And, and what do you feel that we can do to work together collectively to bring in a myth that's life affirmative? Yeah, big, nice question. Um, well, uh, <laughs> first of all, uh, the first thing that comes to mind is uh, the idea uh, that the myth, as you pointed out, in our in our modern culture, techno scientific culture, um, it's equated to something fanciful, something that is not real. It's a story for children, yeah. And uh, and it's interesting because this same attitude actually goes for another word, uh, which is imagination. And I have uh, spoken about this. Uh, in other situation where, you know, imagination, especially in the context of a techno scientific society, so in science, um, is this again, it's got the same description, something fanciful, something uh, you are imagining things, right? They're not real. Get real. Childish. That's right. And uh, we don't need these dreams. We need the real dreams. Now, the, the reason why the two comes together for me is because, uh, uh, whether we like it or not, we are living the dream. We are living the myth of humanity right now. And, um, and the imagination is the key ingredient. We are imagining, we are pro producing images of what it is that we want to see in the world. So I think that uh, it's not the myth itself that is failing us, but it's a failure of imagination that we can only think and imagine such a reducive reductive and uh, uh, poor driven society um, you know where resources are scarce and in fact as you described we need to protect the little bit that we have from someone else otherwise there is no enough and um, and even in science you know uh, the entire argument which is uh, at one level is correct and it would be very dangerous I think to say the contrary you know that ecological resources are finite. You know, you can't just keep reaping, 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 expecting that they're going to be there forever. But at the same time, they are only finite because of the attitude that we bring. So the story that we are weaving, they are actually infinitely abundant and infinitely self-sustained if we build, if we live a story of reciprocity. And this is the key. I think that the story that we are weaving is a story of selfishness, literally. Focusing just on the self as if that was all in matter, but also as if that was all that there is. And reciprocity demands that, uh, the, you acknowledge that there is the self as the individual, as we spoke before. And also the, the, the greater self, which is spread, literally stretched out everywhere. So that then when you are, uh, looking after the self at both levels, you are in reciprocity with yourself, not just like, Oh, I'm doing something for you. But you're doing it for the self, for the greater self. And also reciprocity, of course, is a key word for many indigenous cultures. And, um, and one thing that I really got recently, actually, again, thanks to a plant, <laughs> it was this, uh, I did go really deeply into this concept of reciprocity. And I was looking at the, I was invited to look at the relationship that I have. Where is the reciprocity in my relationship, both with humans and not? with my work, with everything, and really examine, like, uh, where, how are your relationships? Are they in reciprocity, which means are they in balance? And what I found was something interesting that really got me to understand why in some cultures, at least here in Australia, I know that in many indigenous Australian cultures, there is no word for thank you. Because thank oh. you already... A, a, Thank you, say thank you, already assumes that I am taking something from you or you're giving something that I didn't have. 
in reciprocity, that something is not given or taken. It's just shared. So there is no need to thank anything or anyone because it's understood at a deeper level that we are all, that there is no one can give anything or take anything. Everyone is here into this shared melting pot. And I guess in this sense, this is why the profound um, wisdom that is embedded in the in an indigenous culture like the one that we have in Australia, and there are lots of different perspectives, but as a generic statement, is like the fact that even the language wouldn't allow for that separation. And the language is demanding that you acknowledge that it's all in reciprocity, always. Uh, it's uh, To me, it was very profound because then I applied it to the story that I'm weaving about my life and my relationships and really got me to uh, have some very courageous conversation with some people who I have close that um, I consider friends or, you know, loved ones. And like, uh, are we actually in reciprocity? What is it that you need? What is it that I need? Are we actually in balance here? Any for some of these relationships, some of these relationships just basically dissipated. And it was basically like, uh, no, we're not in reciprocity. We're not operating both together from that place. And so actually, if you can operate from that place, then you are not relating. You're not relating. When there is a willingness to, to relate, then you are, there is a willingness to find the balance of reciprocity. And it doesn't mean that I have to give exactly the same equal amount as you're giving me, but it's, um, it's a much deeper, I, I find it even difficult to, to say it in words because the feeling is a much deeper, uh, knowing that there is nothing that I, there is, I, I don't own anything. I cannot, that's why even here in Australia and I know other cultures, you know, in the US, I'm sure some similar concept in the, uh, Native American cultures are there as well. Like, we don't own the land. And even this idea that, you know, in, in Australia, at least the people, like indigenous people have to show that they are the traditional owners. That's not that language. That is the colonial language. It still thinks the same way and thinks like, well, we took your thing. Now we can maybe give it back if you show me that it's, you're really the rightful owner. And th- there's such a missing point there of like, this is still the old story. You might give me back my land, but that's not the point. The point is that you have broken a relationship and I'm trying to mend it here. And so even in this exercise of, you know, in the smallness of my own little life with my own relationships uh, and thinking about the future, I feel really excited because what I'm interested in creating, and I know that this is not just me, it's uh, I, I have encountered it in many places now, there is this desire of um, co-creating with the entire system. So co-creating with the land, co-creating with the animals and the plants that live with us in this place. And, um, and you know, some people think, and, and I think this is part, again, of the story that uh, we I think we need to weave. It's like some people think, like, yeah, that's nice, well, and good, but, you know, how is that going to change the world if one person over here, one person over there only do it? You know, it's, yeah, nice effort, but how? But actually, as we know well, change never happened because one superhero came and like that happens in the movies <laughs> but it never really happens because there is one superhero that changed the game and saved the days the day is saved by the the masses actually by the numbers it's saved by everyone actually contributing and being in reciprocity in this story and so I guess the 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 big change that uh, is needed is uh, again it's a matter of human spirit and the story that we want to tell. There is a story of abundance where yes there is enough for everyone and yes if you have a lot it's your responsibility towards this reciprocity to share and make sure that every other part of you whether it's you yourself the physical being or any other part of the system is fed nurtured loved cared for. If not, you're not in reciprocity and you're just repeating the old story. And we know already where the old story goes because we've seen it repli- replicated over and over and over again. It's a disempowering story for everyone. So, yeah. And the story, of course, is already written. It's already possible. 
It's just then it comes down to like, are we going to choose to tell that story or this story? And whichever story we go, we'll have to then take the consequences. Hi, everybody. Do you guys want to know one of my secret weapons that helps me avoid being sick or feeling run down? It's Organifi Immunity. Organifi Immunity is a super high quality certified organic drink mix that provides daily immune support and supports overall immunity. Organifi Immunity contains whole food vitamins C and D, whole food zinc, mushroom beta glycans, and provides only natural sweetness. Not only will you support your immune system, but you'll also get on the go superfoods in a delicious orange blend that is great for you and your kids and everyone will love it. My family and I love it, and it's easy as tearing off the top of the package and mixing it with high-quality drinking water, and you can rest a little easier knowing that you're enhancing your immune system, which is probably a good idea now that so many people are spending so much time indoors, breathing indoor air, and lacking sun exposure. Why not enjoy a little immune insurance while getting certified organic nutrients, superfoods, and great taste that's quick, easy, and effective? To get your Organifi immunity and shop their amazing product line with your Living 4D discount, Go to O-R-G-A-N-I-F-I dot com and save 20% on any and all of their products using the code capital C, capital H, capital E, capital K, 20. That's check 20 during checkout. Enjoy Organifi. Joseph Campbell says something quite profound. He said, if you want to find out who your God is, Ask yourself what you cannot live without for two or three days. And I think we are dangerously close to finding out who our God is, because if we go one step further with polluting nature, you know, we've now lost in the last 50 years, current research shows that we've lost 60% of animal species on the planet. 75% of insect population is gone. We've poisoned the oceans. We've poisoned the rivers. There's hardly any clean water everywhere we have anywhere. We have serious problems with reproduction, cancer, disease, malformations in creatures from fish to uh, salamanders to you everywhere in nature where they're getting hit by these chemicals. Steiner said, human life as you know it depends on two things, bees and trees. And if they ever reach a critically low level, life will cease to exist as you know it. And we are running out of bees and trees. Uh, the book, The Invisible Rainbow by Arthur Furstenberg, sh- shockingly documents how long we've been destroying bees with electromagnetic pollution and shows that every time they put up a huge radar system or new radio broadcast tower, that bees started dropping dead everywhere all around it. And beekeepers were getting completely pissed off and freaked out. He even talks about how one beekeeper was so upset. It was actually quite a long time ago when Marconi built one of his first massive radio towers. It was killing all the bees and the beekeeper was so upset he broke through the door of the radio tower with a gun in his hand telling him he better shut this thing down or else um, because he realized what it was doing to nature. And technologists, you know, the big tech corps, they keep burying all this science. In fact, Arthur Furstenberg talks about how he asked to see how they came to their conclusions that cell phones weren't causing brain cancer and many other things, and they would not release the research to them, which shows you that they don't want you to know the results of their own research. These are very immoral, unethical applications of technology that are really all about money at the end of the day. The point I'm making here, if it's not crystal clear, (laughs) <laughs> we are very close to finding out what we can't live without for two or three days, but it might be two or three hundred days or more or or uh, an eon. And then we're going to wake up and realize that our plant kingdom and the animal kingdom is not only part of us, but in many ways it was our mother and our father, like Mother Earth, and that we got our myths very, very dangerously confused. And it's interesting too, because in in The Invisible Rainbow, he talks about how in Chernobyl, when the Chernobyl event happened, how the radiation killed everything and it was just a wasteland. And people all had, of course, to leave because of the danger of radiation. But he said only 20 years later, 
that exactly that area is now the most lush area in Russia. And they've actually done studies on it. And so he showed all you had to do to heal nature was get rid of human beings. So I think people need to wake up to the fact that we are we don't own the planet and we aren't the kings and the rulers of it. And we are being utterly disrespectful to the rest of life. And that life supports us. And the reality of it is Mother Nature or Gaia may have to actually get rid of us as a parasite infection for her to heal. But I think we have a window of time, and that's what my podcast is devoted to. And that's why I find people like you that are scientists and that really do have deep knowledge to really say, hey, those of you with a left brain, you need to pay attention, but you need to listen with your right brain because Mm -hmm. what's going on is not outside of science. We have the science to say unequivocally, we're destroying our own habitat and we need to wake up now. And and we, you know, as a, you, you can't eat money. I don't care how much money you have. If you have money, but no life, you're stuck. You cannot eat it. So I think that we're in a, a very important time in our collective spiritual awakening and that we have a window before we don't make it through our initiation trial because we uh, get caught in the middle of the fire of our own making. Um, if you have any other closing thoughts uh, on that, I'd like to ask you one more question before we close the show today. Yeah, I just wanted to add, uh, as we said before, like, uh, yeah, initiation is supposed to be scary. Initiation is designed to freak you out and kill that part of you that is no longer serving the the picture of your growth. And if we say that your growth is not just yours, but is, uh, you know, this collective, because you are a collective, whether you are aware of it or not, then this is an amazing time for of, not for, of initiation. And we're going through it right now. And I agree, sometimes initiation uh you know you don't make it and um but you're gonna have right. to try and give the best that you have right so i think the the danger here that i see is that um you know especially at the moment you know cop 26 and we are having this uh, great more conversation more discussions more uh, let's push the date when we're gonna actually do something somewhere over there in the future where me, as the politician right now, involved in this conversation, I probably won't even be here anymore. So it's not more my problem. And uh, again, it's, the, it's this attitude of um, not a sense of reciprocity, not a sense of responsibility towards the future generations, not a sense of like, uh, uh, I want to, uh, why, have I, why am I here? Why have I come here? If not, to really create and ensure that more beauty and more love is expressed through this creation. So I guess what I'm trying to say is like, uh, no more talking, no more talking. We all know that the situation is dear. We all know what we need to do. Let's do it. And so for me, my next step is just about, uh, you know, I, I don't really want to talk about it too much anymore. I just really want to uh, get to the work of doing and the doing that I can see it's my job of doing is to create a space where all of these beautiful uh, skills that we have from the science to like the uh, the learning and education to the well-being of the body and the, the ceremony you know the sacredness are all brought together for those who are on the verge of waking up and they're like, uh, I just don't know how to do this. As I come, come and experience. It's easy. You just need to be on the land. You just need to be held. You just need the the right uh, frameworks that allow you to explore instead of being constrained by frameworks that demand that you comply. And um, allow, allow, come in and experience this. Come and listen. And uh, I think again, as I said before, if. If we focus on the on the right action, and the right action is the the one that we intrinsically know, it's already know. It's like we already know what we need to do. We already know. Even the politician that keeps saying, you know, oh, we don't want to participate in this, but they already know that if they got kids in particular, they already know 
what it is that is needed. So if they're not, if we are not going to do it for ourselves, because let's face it, pretty much anybody that is listening uh, to this podcast right now probably won't be here to face the real consequences. And but their kids will, their grandkids will. Yes, my kids will. That's I've got right. a two-year-old and a five-year-old. Exactly. And I've got a grandchild. I've, you know, and and I, I'm like. Both of the souls of these children told me coming in that the earth was going to go through some very radical, serious changes. And they both came because they have skills that they That's right. um, are coming to earth to share. So the thing is, is that, you know, we don't need to leave the, the world in a state of disaster for That's our children. Right. I mean, what kind of parenting and what kind of love is that? And I, I think spiritually... All we have to do is ask ourselves collectively one question each day. What would love do now? That's right. That's right. And if we just ask that honestly and respond honestly, you know, the, the old saying, the, the longest journey you'll ever take is from your head to your heart. But that is the spiritual journey. And we've been taking too long. I think, you know, it's only one foot for most people. But we've got to get there quick and we've got to stop all this racial segregation and religious segregation and circle the globe as a human family. And remember, we are living in a garden and we must become gardeners, not destroyers, not warmongers, not, you know, chemical wizards that destroy everything. And look how proud I am. I stopped the weeds from growing. Yeah, but you don't know anything about why the weeds are growing in the first place. You know, that's the problem. That's right. We are so, family and we are all related. If there was a, this is it. Yeah, this is it. And, um, you know, Monica, if you were going to leave the earth tomorrow and you knew it, what would be your parting message for everybody? <laughs> It's like, um, I don't know, I never thought of that. But I do think about it a lot. It's like, have I said everything that I needed to say? Have I done everything that I needed to do? Uh, especially when I'm traveling. I don't know why I think of that when I travel. And, and usually, if I'm in a, in a plane, by the time I land, if I found anything that I needed to do or say, I go and do it straight away. And, uh, and so I always, um, you know, engage with my uh, death in a way. And so it's like, uh, yeah, um, engage with death, this myth of uh, eternal life in a, uh, in a limited universe. It actually makes no sense. It's like, and, and so I guess like engage with your unlimited universe and um, you already have eternal life. So don't worry about that part. <laughs> and so if the, if the world and the universe is unlimited, this is really the best that you could do? And I always ask myself, is this the best that I can do? What else can I do? What else could I get engaged? What else what can I create? And um, yeah, and I, I'm not asking my mind to tell me that. I always ask my heart and my and spirit, you know, like, okay, I'm here to serve. How would you like me to serve? Beautiful. And I think, too, what rose in me listening to you is that it doesn't matter whether life and the world or even the universe are finite or infinite, because if you have love in you, then you have a creative spirit in you and love always wants to create beauty. So I say, look around you. Are we creating beauty? You know, are we actually leaving something behind that we can be proud of. You know, when I when I look at my life, my primary objective is to leave the world a little better than I found it. But it takes a lot of us to do that because the world is a big place. So I can leave my 14 acres a lot better than what I found it, but that doesn't mean that my child's future is going to be better because they have to live in the world. They have to go travel. They have to grow up and they have to engage other people and other cultures to learn. So if we all just think, what can we do collectively to create beauty together and to create harmony? Because something's not beautiful if it's not harmonious with its surroundings. That's right. And I think if, if we if we realize 
that we are beautiful and that we are capable and that we are intelligent and that we are capable of connecting to other forms of life, be it plants, microorganisms, animals, even stones. I mean, shaman, you know, people like me work with stones. Healers work with stones. A lot of people have no idea how alive a crystal is, for example. But if we connect to all of it and say, how do we create something that makes everyone safer and makes everyone happier and more whole and create sustainability? I think if we just shift our orientation toward creating beauty instead of who can screw who to make more money and who can lie to who to make more money and how do we segregate this guy and how do we keep tricking people into needing drugs or vaccines or what the hell else it is? It's just people have forgotten that that the lines on the map were drawn on the map by human beings, but there are no lines on Mother Earth. And if we need to get back to that and know that that is the garden that we are responsible for. And if we don't take responsibility for it, then we must take responsibility for the choices that we've made because that's what it means to be an adult. So this is a crisis of a bunch of little spoiled teenagers with cell phones that have to grow up and tend to the garden. That's right. <laughs> well said. So. Monica, where can people find more about you? I know you have your beautiful website, monicagagliano.com, right? Yeah. And I like the style of your website. It's the first one I've ever seen that's a scroll site like that. Okay. <laughs> it's pretty yeah. cool. And uh, Monica's art is at the bottom. Go check it out because you can really feel her in that art. Uh, your book, Thus Spoke the Plant is on Amazon. It's on Amazon. It's also on Audible and Kindle, isn't it? I think so. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's a great book and uh, I love it. Anything else you would like to direct people to? Um, well, I guess like much of my work is uh, shared and it can be found, you know, pretty much around everywhere. Uh, yeah. No, I guess, you know, I have this, uh, if, if you don't mind me doing this, I have this uh, call for action, <laughs> and uh, which is very present yes, for me at the moment. And uh, it is uh, this, uh, what I'm going to be doing next, uh, I'm already doing, but um, it needs to ground properly. And uh, the name of the vision is called Resonant Earth, and it is about regenerating the entire planet and not just planting tree, although that's part of it, but it's not just about plant tree and rescue the coral reefs, but primarily, I think, uh, also from our conversation, it's very clear to me that the regeneration is of the human spirit, and then the human spirit will know what to do. And so, yeah, the entire vision and project is to create, as I was saying before, a space, a physical space where people can come and learn how to reconnect with their humanity, basically, and how to reconnect with their creativity, which might be expressed in science as a science endeavor or through education. And uh, it's a big vision. And the call of action is also to those who have some serious financial resources uh, to help us get this off the ground. As I mentioned, the land actually has been identified from my visions and it's yes. here. And we really need to have the those visionary who can see these uh, to get involved and make this happen now. Because as, you, as we said, we are running out of time. The, what else? I cannot think of any better thing to do with my time whatever time I have left in this life than this. So Right. Well, I read your outline that you politely emailed to me, and, and I'll tell you what, it's fantastic. Uh, it's, it's exactly what my institute's all about. It's what I devoted myself to. You know, I started the institute in 1995. Uh, yours is different because you're a scientist and you have a lot of background in these areas and and so I think both of us are doing the same things, but I really think that because yours is really bringing people to the earth and it's integrating scientists and uh, artists and 
you know, spiritual people together, it's it's almost like you're recreating the Renaissance to bring us back to this melting pot of sharing each other's talents and skills with the intention of regenerating the planet. And I, I think it really deserves funding. And I think it, uh, for any of you listening that want to look at Monica's project and maybe invest in it, I can't, I tell you, I, I, I absolutely love it. So, and I think anyone that's listened to this podcast this long is the kind of person that would want to be involved. Uh, is there somewhere specific that people can reach you if they want to know more about the project or even invest in it or, or get a, uh, uh, have you send them a proposal? Uh, well, they can get in touch with me directly at this stage. Uh, um, yeah, I, I don't have a website for it specifically uh, because I, again, in that spirit of allowing the land to also have a say and be a co-creation, I feel like they, although this is counterintuitive because this is how we usually do business, but I really feel that I cannot create a, a website and tell you exactly what we're going to be doing until all of the participants are present and heard. And so it's almost like uh, it's a difficult step in the sense that, um, yeah, I have this uh, short outline, uh, but I'm asking people to step into the unknown, to step into the unexpected, because this is where we are stepping in anyway, but we do it. Uh, consciously oh, yeah. and we do it together and and really trusting that if we are listening properly uh we are going to be guided we are already guided and so there is no such a website yet because uh, not all the voices that need to say uh have have spoken yet the land included but people can definitely contact me directly so yeah uh, how do they do that they can contact me on my on my email or even on the website that you just mentioned. Uh, I can receive those emails, no problem. So either they contact me through my work or yeah. Yeah, you haven't shared your email, or do you want them to just use the contact you at the website to get to you? Yeah, and then I can share the rest of the content so that yeah, then my feels better. Okay, yeah, <laughs> so you, you don't get overwhelmed with a million emails. Yeah, good. I just wanted to make sure it was clear how to get there. So if you want to contact Monica, go to monicagagliano.com and then look for the contact se uh, section on the website and please explore what she's offering. I think it's absolutely an amazing and critical process that would integrate scientists and creative minds of all types. And the project will give them a location, a headquarters, land, to do the research, the work, and and develop the knowledge, wisdom, and practices that we need to implement on this planet immediately. So if you're hearing the call for action, here it is. If you've got knowledge, if you've got skills, if you've got money to invest, get a hold of Monica and let's do this thing. Monica, you, you're Paul. amazing. What a fun and informative podcast. Monica, let me know how it goes with your project and I'll do everything I can do to support you. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Paul. Yeah. Thank you everyone already in advance. Yes. And thank you to the sponsors for all your love and support. And thank you to all of you for anything you buy from the sponsors. A small commission goes to me to support the podcast so I can do the work I can do to help educate you and find amazing people like Monica to share with all of us and help us grow up <laughs> and learn more and love more. And uh, I look forward to sharing more with you soon. So as I like to say, we are safe. We are home. We are whole. A whole great spirit. It is uh -huh. done. It is done. It is done. Thank you, Monica. Big hug. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for listening to Living 4D with Paul Check and today's guest, Monica Gagliano. You can follow her on Twitter at Monica underscore Gagliano, on Instagram at underscore Monica Gagliano underscore, or on Facebook at Monica.Gagliano.18. To find out where Monica is speaking and other events, visit her website, MonicaGagliano.com. That's M O N. I-C-A-G-A-G-L-I-A-N-O dot com. Follow Paul Check on Instagram at Paul.Check, on Twitter at Paul Check, 
or on his YouTube podcast channel, youtube.com forward slash living 4D with Paul Check. Watch more on Paul's blog at paulchecksblog.com and get your free subscription to Czech videos and more at the Czech Institute's new media site, tekiva.com. Remember, you can read the show notes and find links to the resources mentioned in this episode at checkinstitute.com forward slash podcast.